Hey guys, hope you're having a phenomenal spooky season, or if you're watching this after Halloween, just a phenomenal season overall, whatever that may be. And welcome to today's compilation of various horror stories that we have covered across Star Wars lore. Thank you guys so much for your support on the channel recently. Love you all so much. More Star Wars horror stories to follow, by the way. And for now, enjoy the compilation. There are many reasons why one would become a Sith Lord. The most popular avenue to the dark side is that of revenge, but equally as popular are those who desire power. In other cases though, one may follow the path to the dark side simply because they are insane and greatly enjoy causing as much suffering as possible. Such psychopaths are usually seen as barbaric even among Sith. Many Sith believe that this hinders the greater empire and desire to achieve something instead of indulging in butchery and murder. But there was one Sith Psycho that enjoyed his cruelty so much that he deviated from the traditional path of a Sith just so he could do more of it. This was Darth Maumon, a canon Sith Lord who instead of focusing his time and energy on destruction, chose to become a Sith artist bent on creation instead. But what he created were vile disturbances in the Force. Darth Maumon made things that should have never seen the light of day. And in today's Holocron, we are going to be talking about all of his life and his legacy, from the moment that he began his training as a Dark Lord, to the day that his spirit made his final mistake by crossing Darth Vader. Welcome back to the archives, my friends, and let us begin. Darth Vader 2017 number 21 is where Maumon makes his first appearance. Maumon was a name that was expunged from most records. The day Sidious gifted the mask of Maumon to his apprentice Vader, he mentioned that he had never so much as heard the name of Maumon in any holocron, Jedi, or Sith. Sidious said that Maumon was an uncommon Sith Lord, not only for his penchant for creation rather than destruction, but because the paths he walked through the dark side were deemed heretical, and this is why he was suppressed, even by the Sith. Chronologically in canon, Maumon is actually one of the earliest Sith Lords, and his mask lay hidden in the Forbidden Jedi archives for centuries on end. Vader would later ask his master how he knew of Maumon, and Darth Sidious's haunting answer was that the mask had spoken to him. Little did Vader know that the spooky sentence was a dark omen of what was to come when Vader took the mask with him to Mustafar, the place that Vader planned to build his castle. But now, we must travel back a thousand years to see just who Darth Maumon really was. In Darth Vader number 22, long ago, Maumon was a humanoid of an unknown species who considered himself to be a sculptor. However, his sculptures were made of living creatures. As a child, his mother came into his room once to find that he has dissected the family cat with kitchen tools and had made it into a disgusting work of art. As he grew older, he would delve into even darker tendencies and would go on a killing spree, kidnapping individuals of his home world and butchering them before reassembling their bodies, entrails, and flesh into a horrific sculpture that he placed in the middle of his town. He didn't even attempt to hide himself, but stood in front of it to enjoy the reactions of all those that came across it. According to Maumon, any sculpture that doesn't make the viewer feel something is not art at all. Pain and fear are the most basic emotions of any being, things they feel as soon as they are born. When these things are felt again, it brings all beings to their most fundamental selves and turns them back into animals. Maumon believed that this is something that all people need to feel, to remind them of who they really are, and Maumon desires to do this through his sculptures and his art. He was later arrested though and taken to prison for his heinous crime, but his name would echo amongst the stars and he would soon be found by a dark lady of the Sith named Lady Shah. After hearing of his exploits, Shah hunted Maumon down and liberated him from prison, taking him officially as her apprentice. Under Lady Shah's tutelage, Maumon would create his signature mask, pouring the dark side into it. Once he finished, he would use the tools to carve up and disfigure his own face in order to wear it, as he required it now. He would then go on to repurpose these exact tools into becoming his lightsaber. Building two of them, Maumon learned so much about the dark side that he felt completed by what Lady Shah had taught him, grateful. However, he fundamentally disagreed with the idea of a master and apprentice dynamic and label. Maumon was not about to call himself a master, but he hated being labeled as an apprentice, stating that he was second to none, that all he lacked was knowledge, never power or insight. Shaw attempted to punish him for this heresy, 
but he ended up murdering her in a duel, determined to finish his training through his own personal studies. As a result, Mommen chose to never take an apprentice of his own, saying that there was too much to learn and not enough time to teach. During this period of time, by the way, there are multiple Sith Lords that exist in the galaxy, meaning that Mommen was a dark sheep even among the Sith Order, breaking away from their core beliefs. Mommen embarked on a journey around the galaxy, studying the lore of the dark side in all of its aspects and visiting many great and terrible sites. During this, Mommen realized that he had been wasting his time creating work for ordinary beings, beings who would never appreciate nor understand his art. Mommen decided that the Force itself was the only true audience that was worth impressing, and he decided that if he could build something worthy of the grandeur of the dark side, that he may become worthy himself. What this means, though, is exactly uncertain, but he could be speaking of eternal life. Mommen sought the dark side deeply for answers, looking for a direction to go and how to build his magnum opus. Mommen needed to make sure this was something that could not be ignored or locked away. The Force chose him, and he chose a city. Using the resources he inherited from his master and desperate dark side acolytes, he developed two key weapons. The first was known as the Fermata Cage, and the second was a device he only referred to as the Great Engine. The Great Engine was powerful enough to burn cities to the ground, turning them to ash. But in order to be worthy of the Force, Mommen's work of art had to be so much more than even this. The Fermata Cage was then activated, and it would be able to literally freeze time itself. Mommen determined that he would only begin to destroy the city, letting the heat and the flames rise. But at the very moment the people realized their imminent doom, he would pour the force into his engine, activating the cage, and to stop the flow of time. All of those minds reacting as one to pain and fear on a scale that the galaxy had never known frozen in time like insects in sap for anyone to see, and behold, forever. Momen decided that this would be an eternal shrine to the dark side, his masterpiece. All was well at first when he was at the controls, ready to bring his truthful art into being. But then the Jedi arrived. The Acolytes were slain by the Jedi strike team after putting up a fight, and the presence of the light side of the Force interfered with Mommen's concentration. The Dark Lord lost control of his massive engine, and as he was attempting to wield it, his body was consumed into the fires of his own creation. The dark side demanded more than death from Mommen, so whether it was intentional or not, Mommen's spirit was trapped inside of his mask, his physical body atomized out of existence. And although his project was a failure, he would go on to learn an important lesson about the dark side. It was a raging inferno that must always be fed, one that demanded a sacrifice, and that if you cannot feed it, then it will feed upon you. In present day, Vader had selected Mustafar to build his castle because he had found a Sith cave potent with the dark side. He intended to meditate upon the cave and discover a way to bring Padme back from death. While he never divulged his plan, Sidious knew of his intention and decided to give him the Mask of Mommen as a gift, saying to use it for inspiration. Sidious knew the psychotic trapped spear of Mommen was in the mask, and he wanted to see what would happen, likely just for pure entertainment. While on Mustafar, the mask ended up possessing the assistant of the Imperial Architect that was building Vader's castle. Mommen in the assistant's body killed the Imperial Architect and decided to work on a design for Vader's castle himself. When Vader heard the Architect scream, he went to investigate, only to find her body and the assistant with the mask of Mommen working at her desk. Vader immediately killed the assistant, but saw the design of the castle that Mommen had drawn up. Intrigued by it, Vader took the mask to the dark side cave and demanded answers. Momen freely told Vader his entire life story, but when it was over, Vader realized that he had taken off his own helmet and was slowly putting on the mask of Momen. Waking from this trance, he threw the mask at the wall, breaking the spell that the spirit had put over him. A very close call to be sure. While distrustful of the ancient Sith architect, Vader was still intrigued by the design that he had come up with. Later, Vader would be butchering a group of native Mustafarians who had joined forces and opposed the castle being constructed on their world. Vader would grab one, forcing him to wear the mask so that the spirit of Momen could possess a physical body in order to do his work. Inside the dark side cave, Momen identifies the Sith location as being the Force Locus, which was a literal door, a pathway into the dark side, 
Malman then explains that the door was locked, and that the castle idea he came up with was meant to be the key, at least theoretically, to the dark side itself. Moment had seen into Vader's mind momentarily when he nearly put on his mask, so he knew the true reason why Vader needed this door unlocked. He promised that the castle will create essentially a tune of energy of the Locus, using the dark side of the Force to peer the veil of time between life and death. This could possibly be a door into the world between worlds, but this isn't necessarily shown to be true. Momin promises Vader, though, that he will see his beloved again. But Vader interrupts him with a force choke, telling him that he has been lied to about the dark side's ability to prevent death before. Vader warns Momin not to promise things that he can't provide, and that if Momin betrays him, that he will suffer. Momin promised at the time, though, that he only wanted to create perfection, and that this opportunity would be his masterpiece that he never got to complete in life. At this point, Momin is unable to fight back against Vader because he is technically only a mask. The Force is denied to him while he is possessing non-Force sensitive bodies, and because of this, he and Vader work together to tune the structure. Using Imperial resources, the construction of Vader's castle officially begins. However, this would prove to be no easy process. The first five designs completely failed. Each time Vader attempted to open the gateway, Mustafar's weather would go out of control due to the energies of the dark side. The native Mustafarians were beginning to grow agitated, as they sensed that their planet would rip itself apart if something was not done. Vader was infuriated following the fifth failure, and he killed the host body of Momin. He then shoved the mask on a nearby stormtrooper to try again. The very beasts and natives of Mustafar were conspiring to stop the Imperials for continuing to build this monstrous castle, this monstrous key, as they repeatedly attacked the worksite. Meanwhile, Vader and Momin continued to try out new designs. In the end, it would take nine total castle designs, with each one being destroyed in various ways. Each time they failed, Vader would kill Momin's body and put the helmet on another to continue his work. By the ninth design, we get the castle that we all know, and Vader warned Momin that one way or another, there would be no tenth. The ninth castle was a smashing success, and Vader managed to successfully open the door to the Force, tearing the veil between time and space. However, as soon as he managed this, his commander rang him over to the calm, informing the Dark Lord of a vast Mustafarian attack force. The entire army of natives had come to tear down the castle brick by brick. The angered Vader went out to deal with the issue, but once he left, Momin finally executed his plan. Vader had opened the way, and Momin used the portal to bring back his own living body. His real form, donning his mask, Darth Momin had returned from death itself. Once outside the castle, Vader saw it activated and knew at once that Momin had betrayed him. And now, we enter Darth Vader 24. Unfortunately, he didn't have the time to worry about Momin. He needed to break the Mustafarians. Vader and the Imperials went to war, and the Dark Lord cut down a great swath of the natives. But their elders, who could use the Force themselves, were connected with the planet. Seeing his power, they fell back on dramatic measures to stop the Dark Lord. Combining their power as one, they lifted the lava lake and caused a massive flood to consume the armies of the Empire, and even Vader. Somehow the Dark Lord kept himself from burning by using the Force as a shield and escaping the magma flood, leaping off the head of an at, -AT walker. However, Vader's armor was put into maximum heat-resistant limits, and he emerged quite injured. Retreating back within his fortress, Vader collapsed on the stone which had opened the portal, only to now be greeted by the living body of Momin. Vader reminded him of the warning of his betrayal, but Momin pointed out that Vader himself looked quite worse for wear, while Momin had been reborn. He admitted earlier that he wasn't nearly as strong as Vader, but he now had the advantage since the Dark Lord was injured. The two entered a duel, with Momin berating him about his beliefs. Momin made fun of Vader for still believing that he was the Chosen One, for thinking that he commanded the Dark Side even though he couldn't stop his wife from dying, nor give himself a new body. Momin then preached his heretical ideas, saying that the Sith cannot control the dark side, that they must always serve it, and when it was served, that it granted them power and even eternal life. The whole time he drives Vader back 
and even manages to sever his right cybernetic arm, disarming Vader of his lightsaber. Even though Vader is vastly depowered in this moment though, we still get to see that Maumon was surprisingly good at lightsaber combat. Long ago as a Sith apprentice, he managed to kill his own master before his training was completed. And here, even though he's dueling a weakened Vader, he still is beating him. Perhaps there's more to the way Maumon uses his tools, his lightsabers, to sculpt his reality, using them as artistic instruments to cut his opponents into works of art. The ancient Sith artist now has Vader backed against the portal rock and is about to deliver the killing blow when Vader asks one more question. If he lied about what was on the other side, Maumon informs him that he had told the truth about what lay beyond. It would have been possible to bring Padme back. This was no lie, but Vader would never be able to pass through, since Vader did not serve the dark side. Vader served only his own power. Maumon berates Vader further about how he and his master had become Jedi-obsessed weaklings, and how Maumon was saddened and disgusted by the state of the Sith. But then, Vader uses the moment of distraction while Maumon was monologuing to call upon one of the large focusing panels with the Force, and to smash Maumon against the wall violently. The ancient Sith Lord shouts in pain, saying that it is impossible to kill him, that the dark side loved him, that the dark side wanted him alive, to which Vader replied that if this was true, then he would live. And with that, Vader crushes Maumon against the wall with a slab of stone, killing him instantly and entirely. Thus ends the story of Lord Maumon, the demented, psychotic artist of the Sith. Our story actually continues though, as Vader tries to open the portal with the Locust, and he actually stepped through the gateway of what Maumon described as the literal dark side. And what Vader sees is astounding. But that, my friends, is a story for another holocron. The but species now, known as the Ewok is legitimately one of the most terrifying species in the entirety of Star Wars lore. Their ability to destroy the Empire and to fight off the Stormtroopers in Return of the Jedi was legendary, but what those troopers experienced that day was a fate far worse than what anybody suffered on the battle station above them. The terror that they faced that dreadful night, the night where the Ewoks came to hunt. Greetings, students, and scholars of the Force, and welcome back to the Archives. Today, we will be delving into one of the most terrifying species in all of Star Wars, one of the most unassuming and famous. And if you're curious, the answer is yes, the Ewoks do in fact eat people. So without further ado, let us begin and discuss exactly what makes the Ewoks one of the most vicious species in all of Star Wars, their terrifying golden god, and the terrible fate of the Stormtroopers after the Battle of Endor. Our story today comes from Legends Continuity and is Star Wars Tales number 14, Endor Apocalypse. Our story begins in a bar with a patron there that claims to be a former Stormtrooper, someone who thought very highly of Lord Vader. The Stormtrooper even remarks a single time that Lord Vader said that he was proud of his squad, and even though they allowed the Falcon to escape Hoth, Vader said that the squad tried their best. However, he would later go on to execute half of them. The Stormtrooper reminisces about how things were great under the Empire, how they had mastered what true strength was meant to represent. That was until the Empire met the Ewoks. This Stormtrooper was at the Battle of Endor. Across the bar, another patron, presumably a bounty hunter, comments on what the Stormtrooper is talking about, saying, how could the Empire possibly have lost to these fuzzy teddy bears? The Empire had blasters, walkers, the finest technology that the galaxy had to offer, the finest weaponry, and yet, the Ewoks decimated them. The man comments about how the Stormtroopers became the laughingstock of the galaxy after Endor, and questions how they could have possibly lost to the cute little teddy bears. But the Stormtroopers' reply is chilling. He says, that is exactly what we thought about them. At first, the Stormtrooper flashes back to Endor, saying that he knew that the culture was primitive, that they should have been no threat to the Greater Empire. The Stormtroopers were not worried or concerned about the Ewoks in the slightest. The Stormtrooper goes over first contact, when the Ewoks emerge from the jungle, offering the Stormtroopers some flowers, offering them peace. However, the Stormtroopers immediately turned their blasters on the Ewoks, mowing down as many as possible, claiming that the true purpose of the flowers was to block the barrels of their guns. Everything was fine and quiet on Endor until the night came. 
and the Ewoks began picking off the stormtroopers one by one, laying traps all around their camp, hanging them from nooses, dragging them away into the night. The squad was terrified. All around them, Ewoks were picking off their brothers one at a time, disappearing. All they could hear was their screams echoing through the endlessly dark abyss that was the forest. And with the stormtroopers, an eerie thought entered their minds. What exactly is happening with our brothers out there? Are the rumors true? Do the Ewoks truly eat people? The stormtroopers huddled together in absolute fear, all of them hypothesizing why the Ewoks would possibly be murdering them one at a time. They begin to hypothesize that this is a ritualistic killing, that by eating them, that the Ewoks were taking their spirits into themselves. And that's when the drums begin the maddening drums of the Ewoks, marking the death of the Empire. All through the night, the drums ring, and when the sun finally rose, they found one of their troopers, a trooper by the name of Kovac, who had indeed been eaten by the Ewoks, his helmet and what was left of his body placed in a puddle on the ground. On the second night, one of the stormtroopers had absolutely lost it. Grabbing his repeating charge blaster, he ran into the jungle, firing aimlessly at whatever moved, firing blindly into the night. When he was out of ammo, slowly from the darkness, the man would see eyes. What happened to the trooper is unknown. All that is known is that he was never seen again. The next day though, some hope was brought to the Empire. Lord Vader had arrived on Endor, informing the squad that they would now be attacking the rebel forces. The stormtroopers were elated, Finally, they had something to fight. But as they ventured through the jungle, things only got worse. They soon discovered that it had been laced with booby traps of all sorts. Deep holes in the ground had been dug with spikes. Arrows flew through the trees. Rocks crushed troopers. Not only were the stormtroopers being executed, but they were being executed in brutal fashion. Fear spread through their ranks like a plague, and the Ewoks never relented swinging from the trees with spears, impaling troopers through the neck, back, wherever they could get them. As the rest of the squad ran, screaming, they left behind a soul trooper. The trooper that we now find in the bar. Just as he was about to be executed by a group of Ewoks, a rebel soldier emerges from the trees, telling them that the battle is over and to spare the life of the trooper. The trooper, however, said this. One thing kept me going all these years later, all that time after Endor, through all the bad dreams that chill me to my feet. You know what it is? It's that while I never had a good night's sleep since Endor, at least I can take comfort in the fact that when 30 billion tons of metal explodes in the lower atmosphere of a small moon, it's only got one place to go. Switching back to the bar, the patron says this, that is a myth. Everyone knows most of the Death Star simply vaporized. The rebel fleet intercepted the rest of the wreckage, to which the stormtrooper says, oh, they did, well, oh, indicating that this all could have been a lie, or perhaps it is reality. Perhaps the Ewoks really are as brutal as we all think. But what about the Ewoks culture? Do they truly eat people? Not a lot is known about the Ewoks in the galaxy. They are regarded as primitive. However, what was shocking about them was just how skilled of warriors they truly were. They were precise, disciplined, inventive, ruthless, and have even been described as masters of warfare. They tormented the Imperials in the night, mastering psychological warfare as well. This is what truly defeated the Empire, the mind games that went on. And in the morning, the Ewoks found out that they had ritualistically devoured their friends, taking their spirit, their strength, their energy into themselves, absorbing it. They were going to do the same thing in Return of the Jedi had they not been saved by the Golden Protocol droid C-3PO, who they believed was their god, who they referred to as the Golden One. If you want to know something truly disturbing about the Ewoks, in Shattered Empire No. 1, there is an exchange between two rebel soldiers at the celebration of Endor, in which one of them says, I don't know what I'm eating, but I think I'll have another. While it is not clear, the dark twisted joke is that the rebels are actually partaking in eating stormtroopers that the Ewoks prepared for them following Endor. And in the canon Star Wars novel, Star Wars Aftermath, there is this passage about the Ewoks. Some of them are faceless, nameless, to him at least, but others he knows, or he knew. There, the flesh-faced officer Kirk Lorman 
good kid, eager to please. He joined the Empire because that's what you did. Not a true believer, not by a long stretch. Not far from him, Captain Blevins, definitely a true believer himself, a froth-mouthed braggart and a bully. His face is a mask of blood. And then you have Sinjir, is glad to be the one that is dead. Nearby was a young woman. He knows her face from the mess, but not her name. And the insignia rank on her chest has been covered in blood. Whoever she was, she's nobody now. Much for the forest, food for the native Ewoks, just stardust and nothing. The more we learn of the Ewoks, one thing becomes terrifyingly clear. What they did to the Imperials that day was brutal, and it stuck with them forever. These are stormtroopers that have seen war. Many of them, war is all that they have known for the past few years. So the fact that these teddy bears shook these hardened soldiers to their core speaks to how terrifying their interactions really were with the Ewoks, and how they didn't want to end up like so many of the other troopers, eaten ritualistically in order to consume their spirit and their strength. The Ewoks are without a doubt one of the most terrifying species in all of Star Wars lore, and on the surface, you wouldn't really believe it. But anyway, the friends, the pelt of the Wampa is one of the most prized and expensive pieces on the black market among hunters. But this wasn't because of their rarity like many other creatures, but because of the terror that they inspire. Wampas may have been one of the most horrifying creatures in the entire galaxy. They were not just mere mindless animals that hunted in the snowy plains of Hoth, but were in fact coordinated, deadly killers. They remembered those that wronged them and had an appetite for blood. Many who were caught open in the icy desert preferred to freeze to death than to be found by a wampa. But groups of poachers would risk their lives to hunt down this monster so that they could fetch a high price. But rarely ever did these hunting parties ever make it out alive. And in today's Holocron, we are going to be talking about why wampas were actually creatures of nightmare and should never be hunted. Welcome back to another October edition of Stupendous Wave. Let's get into it. We are all quite familiar with the wampa a yeti-like creature which attacked Luke Skywalker while he was scouting on Hoth. Luke barely escaped the monster's lair with his life, and the hope of the galaxy may have died right there had it not been for his quick thinking, and Han Solo arriving just in time. The Wampa reigned at the top of the Hoth food chain as the planet's most violent and alpha predator. With their strong sense of smell, brute strength, and camouflaging white fur, there was no other being to challenge their status on Hoth. A single powerful blow from a wampa's forearm was enough to neutralize the strongest of prey. The creature's bite was deadly enough to kill beings several times its own size, and they also had razor-sharp claws which were constantly being cut to perfection, sharpened over years of carving ice caves. Very rarely were wampas themselves the victims of predators. In fact, the creatures had no natural enemies except others of their own kind. However, they rarely fought one another unless it was over food, territory, or a mate. Their hunting methods usually involve stalking their prey for an extended period of time. The creatures would emit a smell that would mask their natural scent so that they could not be detected by other creatures until the moment was right. But in their stalking, they also learned about the creature that they were hunting in order to best approach it. While their main method of attack is stealth and ambush, they will often mentally torture and trap their prey before attacking. This is where the horror begins. Wampas rarely killed their prey outright, because they preferred fresh meat. Wampas instead always tried to stun their prey, keeping their victims unconscious, but alive, until ready to feed. After disabling their prey, Wampas hauled the victim back to their cave dwellings and secured them in the ice for later consumption. To do this, wampas used their hot breath to melt the ice around a victim's legs, and then coated parts of the body in saliva, placing them against the ice ceiling of their caves so that they would freeze in place. The still living victims of the wampa would hang upside down until the creature decided it was time to feed. Hanging the still living victims from the cave ceiling allowed the wampas to keep their food in good condition and then snack at their leisure. Tales existed of victims taking days to die as the wampa slowly devoured them piece at a time. This is where we actually get into the most dangerous part of the wampa. That's their intelligence. Scientists constantly doubt the intelligence of this monster, but this is their own doom. While wampas are known to be solidary hunters, they have shown the ability to coordinate group attacks on large scales. There was one story of a group of failed stormtrooper cadets establishing a business as a guide of leading big game hunters in pursuit of the wampas. Initially, they were met with great success due to their advanced weaponry. However, by their fourth expedition, the wampas had learned their enemy's secrets. 
the hunters had landed and set out in search of their quarry. Meanwhile, the Wampus managed to find and destroy the expedition's ship, and over the course of the next several nights, the Wampus circled the camp, howling madly. The frightened hunters wasted their ammunition shooting at shadows until the Wampas finally attacked. The Wampas dragged the hunters away one by one, whittling down their numbers. Imagine, if you will, being a part of this hunting party, watching one of your number vanish, kicking and screaming in the night. The creatures are far too large to be this silent. This was why the last two survivors killed one another, rather than allow themselves to fall prey to the Wampa. This extends to the Rebel Echo base. Had the Empire not found them when they did, the Alliance likely would have moved off Hoth. Due to their occupation, they had driven a lot of Wampas out of the area where the Echo base had been established. This area had been a rich food source of the Tauntauns, which was the Wampas' primary meal choice on Hoth. The Wampas, having been driven into a glacial valley, decided to band together and to raid Echo Base. This attack had been immortalized in Star Wars Battlefront II's original game as the Hunt minigame. However, it was originally planned to be a main feature in The Empire Strikes Back as Wampas were going to be causing chaos during the Empire's raid on Rebel Base. However, unfortunately, while this didn't make it into the movie, the Wampa attack is still accurate to the continuity in Star Wars Legends. In that story, right before the Empire landed, the monsters began to pick off all the perimeter scouts before crashing through the cavern wall of the base causing a mass slaughter of the rebels. There is a lot which happens in the Wampa attack on Echo Base, so if you would like us to make a full video on the entire story for Halloween, be sure to let us know. If the video, say, gets 4,000 likes, we'll make it really soon. But back to the deadly reputation of the Wampa. Some big game hunters often traveled to the remote Hoth system to hunt them, Poachers and hunters had been tracking Wampas for decades prior to the Clone War. What's insane about this, though, is their own mortality rate exceeded that of what they brought in for the creatures. Wampa pelts or stuffed heads were prized trophies, and a black market fur trading operation existed in the Outer Rim. Wampa souvenirs and even clothing made of their fur had been known to command high prices at galactic trading posts. Wampa meat was also served in some corners of the galaxy, but by one ABY, the sporting hunt of Wampas was now illegal. One of the few good things that the Empire did, but this only served to hike the prices higher on the black market. Perhaps one of the most absurd things to happen with a Wampa is Luke would once again face off against the creature whose arm he had taken in Empire Strikes Back. Twelve years after the Battle of Yavin, Luke Skywalker would return to Hoth alongside one of his Jedi students by the name of Callista Ming. It would be here where the Jedi would discover a group of poachers hiding in the Echo base. They had come to hunt the elusive creatures, and initially found great success. But like the stormtroopers before, they came back to find their ship was destroyed, and their pilots slaughtered. Again, they were picked off one at a time, forcing the last five of them to seek shelter. When Luke Skywalker and Ming arrived on the world just days later, the two Jedi and five survivors were once again attacked by what was described as an army of Wampas together, being led by none other than the dismembered beast. The Wampa recognized Luke Skywalker and Ming's lightsaber as a threat. As a coordinated group, the Wampas ruined the flight controls of the Jedi ship and had again prevented escape. The Horde chased the group back to the confines of the Echo base, as brilliantly and terrifyingly, the creatures created a diversion, banging on the base's closed shield doors, while another group dug through the icy walls of the facility. The two Jedi were able to reach their damaged ship with the stopping power of their lightsabers, and Luke would once again face off with the one-armed Wampa. In a final battle, the Jedi Knight killed the beast at long last, and escaped the planet after rigging the vessel to restart through an alternate power source. Unfortunately, the attack had come at the cost of all five of the remaining poachers. With monsters that display enough intelligence to disable ships, counter blaster technology, and hold grudges against those that have wronged them, there should never be a reason to hunt a wampa. This was why wampas were later included in the New Republic's legislation to protect endangered species, as the wampas were unfortunately nearing extinction, though whether they were placed on the list to protect them or those that would hunt them is uncertain. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think a fantastic Star Wars project would be an R-rated film, one all about the attack of Echo Base, or at least a group of survivors trying to escape Hoth under a Wampa invasion. There's enough about the Wampas to make them the perfect monster for a great creature feature set in a galaxy far, far away. But that's just a simple man's opinion. 
As always, when my we friends. Think of ghosts in Star Wars, what comes to mind is usually the essence left behind by only the strongest of Force users. Some Jedi find out how to retain their identity after passing into the netherworld of the Force, and are able to manifest themselves as Force ghosts to guide living people. Sith that learn of this secret attach their spirits to dark side objects, wanting to terrorize those that would steal their old ancient secrets. But rarely do we think about droids becoming these haunting figures. But that is the case for this next next horror story from the galaxy far, far away, Nobot, the ghost droid of Tatooine. A figure with more myths and rumors surrounding him than almost anything else on the entire planet. The locals of Mos Espa have been so terrified of this single droid that no one will ever go anywhere near it, and they allow it to wander aimlessly around the settlement. So it's time to open up a holocron of our own and find out more about this mysterious droid. Nobot is the same name of the silver-plated 3PO series protocol droid which wanders the searing sand dunes of Tatooine. The droid can be seen out in the dune sea every now and then, but it most often appears in the city of Mos Espa. No matter how many times it has been taken away from that city, it always somehow returns, managing to find its way back. Even the Jawas, who were always looking for tech to savage and sell, have never been able to keep the haunted droid for too long. But who would want to, especially with the absolutely horrific tales that surround Nobot? These rumors were a result of how the droid first arrived in the city, many decades ago. Rumor has it that the droid showed up in Mos Espa wearing marks of blaster fire and covered in dried blood. Its serial number had been scratched off, so there was no way to identify the droid other than it being a 3PO unit made from the Cybot Galactica, the makers of all protocol droids. One of the vendors of Mos Espa by the name of Jira is the one who knows the tale the best, and usually tells her version of the story for the rate of two pegats per telling. According to her, Nobot had been the only witness to the murder of a young pregnant woman, but evidence and rumors began to mount more and more that perhaps the droid itself had been the perpetrator. Very little substantiates this other than what we know the droid says, or more so, what it will not say. Anyone that approaches Nobot or attempts to speak with it will not be met with the idle chit chat or proper speech of any normal protocol droid. Nobot's communication module will play back the recording of the woman being murdered, the murder that he witnessed. The garbled audio was of that of a woman screaming, begging for her life, followed by a long period of static before Nobot repeated the entire interaction. This baffled both the locals and authorities, as no murder or even missing persons have ever been reported anywhere near or in Mos Espa, so no victim was ever claimed. And yet, there was a broken protocol droid, a machine aimlessly wandering repeating back the only evidence that a murder had ever occurred. Reasonably, this creeped out the locals immensely, as they attempted several times to get rid of the droid for it inexplicably showing back up at their city steps after a few days. Some even began to say that evil spirits, or even the dark side of the force was at play around the droid, as anywhere it went, bad luck would follow. Any and all attempts to destroy it were met with unexplainable complications. Young Tusken Raiders attempting to take pot shots at the droid when it was wandering the Dune Sea resulted in their blaster rifles backfiring or becoming completely jammed. Swoop gangs trying to destroy the droid for fun with hooks and chains would have their engines malfunction, or their steering yokes would miraculously rip off. A group of farmers had enough of the strange droid presence once, and finally took it all the way out to the pit of Carcoon and threw it directly into the Sarlacc. But later, Nobot would be seen wandering back into the city of Mos Espa. Now of course, we have to take a lot of this story with a grain of salt. Most of what we know about Nobot comes from the imaginations of the Tatooine locals. There isn't a lot that goes around the city of the dusty planet from day to day, and moisture farmers need something to talk about. Outlandish stories are going to be the way to go, especially when anyone can put their own spin on it. Jiro was the first to tell the story of Nobot, and several other vendors overheard and began to tell their own version while charging rates for it, competing directly with Jira. And of course, it only makes sense as to who would have been around to see if the Tusken Raiders rifles had actually backfired when trying to shoot the droid, and it's pretty suspicious that the murder was not specified, nor the murder victim ever identified. The only reason they suspect anything is because of the droid's communicator, but there was nothing to indicate that the woman being murdered was pregnant. The detail was likely added by Jira herself, 
What's also interesting is that no one really knows where Nobot came from. Only Jira mentioned how the droid looked when it first arrived in Mos Espa all those decades ago. But with all of that said, I do not mean to deter you so far about the legend of Nobot. We do know that there are facts to his story, and the droid is completely unable to speak if not for disturbing playbacks of the woman screaming. Secondly, how does the droid continue managing to reappear right back in the city despite all of the attempts to get rid of it? This is the only notable thing about its own personality, which is, it is very persistent. No matter the weather condition, sandstorms, or scorching heat, no matter the sentient being interfering, Jawas, sand people, gangs, farmers, or even Sarlax, one of the most deadly species in the entire galaxy, Nobot always finds his way back to Mos Espa. No one can get rid of the droid, no one knows where it came from or what to do with it. And now, they leave it alone as a huge attraction to the city, for those brave enough to even get close. But what is the real story of Nobot? Well, if we had to put the pieces together, the droid was probably a part of a ship which was attacked by pirates. It likely saw its master murdered during the raid, and was shot by one or several of the pirates. This would explain the blaster marks and the serial number being scorched off. It would also explain how the droid is damaged, and only able to speak by playing back the last thing that it saw. The woman screaming was the murder happening in front of him, and then the static is what happened as soon as the droid itself was shot. However, it must have reactivated and defaulted to emergency programming, seeking the nearest settlement in order to look for help. However, it was far too late, and so the damaged droid goes to Mos Espa, playing back the recording, hoping that someone will hear its cry for help. But because the droid is now defective, it barely knows what to do but wander around the city after reaching it. That's at least the more probable explanation. But what this doesn't explain is how the droid manages to repair itself and even come back from things that should be impossible, like the Sarlacc pit. And to that end, we offer a more obscure explanation, the dark side. It could be possible that the droid was around a dark side ritual gone wrong. Perhaps they were witness to a ritualistic sacrifice by a dark Jedi or a cult gone wrong. Imagine that the droid witnessed the sacrifice and was overtaken by a mysterious force, the dark side, which then took control of it and altered it. Which we know the dark side can affect technology in a very dangerous way. In fact, there was even a technological virus that was orchestrated and developed by an ancient dark lady of the Sith that nearly destroyed the entirety of the Republic. Something similar could have happened with Nobot, although indirectly. It's possible that Nobot then went on a murder spree, killing each and every one of the cultists, then attempting to fight back, but since the droid can repair itself, it cannot be stopped. This explains the many blaster marks and why the droid was covered in blood. It would also explain Nobot's seemingly supernatural abilities, how it can come back from the dead, because there's something else moving it now, some force placed within it, a nefarious entity if you will, controlling its every action. And maybe, if somebody one day gets too close, they too will experience the truth of what Nobot really is. What the droid exactly is, is a major mystery. But if you ever see it, do not approach, pay your respects, and be mindful of its every move. So, my Order friends, Order 66 was undoubtedly the most devastating event in the Jedi Order's history. In the blink of an eye, nearly the entire Order would be wiped out in a single stroke all across the galaxy. The Sith returned and claimed control for themselves. What followed was Vader and his Inquisitorius, hunting down any remaining Jedi that they could find. This event is in its entirety known as the Great Jedi Purge. However, the name Jedi Purge as a title is a bit of a misnomer, as there was another Jedi Purge that occurred 3,000 years prior. This was the first Jedi Purge, and took place deep into the Old Republic era. The Dark Lords responsible are the Sith Triumvirate, but mainly Darth Nihilus, the Lord of Hunger, as well as contributions indirectly by individuals such as Revan. The Sith Triumvirate caught the eye of the already weakened Jedi Order by storm, and almost rendered them entirely extinct, as they were not prepared for such a threat. At the kicker, this was all Revan's fault. Though interestingly enough, there is very little information surrounding exactly how this purge took place, or what measures the Sith took to nearly destroy the Jedi. But 
we are determined to discover the truth of the First Jedi Purge and unveil a detailed look at exactly what happened during the days of the First Purge, an event that some believe was far worse than Order 66. The year is 3,954 BBY. To set the stage, this is two years after the ending of the Jedi Civil War and the death of Darth Malak. Revan, now having gained back his memories, has vanished once again into the Unknown Regions, only telling the Jedi that he has gone in search for the Sith Empire, the Sith directly who had turned him to the dark side in the first place, Emperor Vitiate. Unfortunately, this was a time when Revan of all people would be needed the most in the galaxy, as the Jedi was on life support. Around this time, the Jedi had suffered several wars in quick succession to one another. There was the Great Sith War first, introducing Exar Kun only a scant 50 years before the Mandalorian Wars and the time of Revan. The war with Exar brought great calamity not only to the Republic, but took a huge blow to the Jedi Order's numbers. Immediately after this would be the Mandalorian Wars, and following that was the Jedi Civil War thanks to Revan and Malak. Three not just conflicts, but full-scale wars in a single lifetime. It is extremely underestimated just how many Jedi lives were lost during each of these conflicts, with thousands of them dying across the short time frame of around 50 years. The Jedi Order was severely weakened, not able to sustain heavy losses within that time frame. On top of all of this, to make matters worse, the Jedi had also sustained a terrible loss. Much of their lore and knowledge had been destroyed in the Great Library on Ossess in the Great Sith War, and next would be the ruin of the Enclave of Jedi on Dantooine during the Jedi Civil War. Many important holocrons, records, and histories had been scattered, lost, or looted during the conflict resulting in only a tiny number of experienced Jedi remaining to instruct new students in a more difficult era with less information and knowledge, subpar training methods, and inadequate weaponry and tools. The Jedi were a shadow of what they had once been, broken, broken down, and severely beaten. The Jedi Order was on life support. If this wasn't bad enough, morale within the Jedi Order was at an all-time low, Two out of three of these devastating wars had been started by former Jedi, and during the fighting, the Order watched a great many of their brethren fall to the dark side. Much of those who remained, though, even council members, were questioning the teachings of the Jedi. They were growing disillusioned with the Order, asking themselves how so many Jedi had fallen to the dark side so easily. The losses were so severe that barely over a hundred Jedi remained after the Jedi Civil War of Revan and Malak. 100 Jedi. This is the estimated number of those that survived the initial stage of Order 66. 100 Jedi remained before the first official purge began. Revan leaving for the Unknown Regions was crippling. He was by far the most knowledgeable and powerful Jedi around, and he seemingly abandoned them. The Republic and the Jedi lost a hero to rally behind. The Republic as an entirety was teetering on collapse, their foundations ruined by the constant galaxy-spanning war. The average citizen of the galaxy of this time began to fear the Jedi instead of trusting them. This caused some Jedi to grow resentful towards the institution that they swore to defend, as after everything, they now not only lost faith of the Republic, but they had sacrificed many lives to protect them. Unlike the Jedi of the Clone Wars, this was certainly not a Jedi Order that was at full strength or numbers. No massive clone army or Order 66 was needed for this purge, and that's when the Sith arrived on the scene, ready to strike the killing, decisive blow to an injured, bleeding Jedi Order. The Sith Treya, Sion, and Nihilus formed what is called the Sith Triumvirate, and arrived in a ghost ship of Nihilus's own design, a vessel known as the Ravager, manned by an undead crew. Wisely though, the Sith did not make a massive announcement of themselves. Instead, they stayed secret, traveling around the galaxy like wraiths of death, grim reapers seeking the souls of Jedi. The Sith had created a genius, but a simple plan, waging what they called a shadow war. This shadow war had one goal, the extinction of the Jedi Order. The sentinels that protected individual systems known as Jedi Watchmen had already began to step down from the Jedi as they were too public of figures and feared that the Sith would come for them. This left those planets weak and the Sith exploited this, attacking them openly. Instead of assaulting the planets directly though, the Triumvirate instigated terrorist attacks and sparked local conflicts on a few select worlds in order to draw the Jedi there. But when they arrived to help the planet, all communication with the Valiant Jedi would be lost, as they would utterly disappear. 
leaving the rest of the Jedi Order stunned and in shambles. Jedi were dying in mass, and they had no idea who was responsible for it, only that they would never be seen or heard from again. The Order eventually discovered this pattern, but they could do nothing to stop it. They couldn't kill an enemy that they could not see, and so fear flew openly in the minds of the Jedi, overtaking their ranks as they quickly decided to scatter, to go into hiding. In reality, what was occurring was that the Sith Lord Darth Nihilus would simply hide in the shadows, catching the Jedi unaware. When they were distracted, Nihilus would reach out and feed off of their very life force, draining them of their energies until they were nothing but ashen husk. As his hunger and power grew, Nihilus was able to feed off of entire groups of Jedi at a single time until his insatiable cravings grew out of control. But while Nihilus searched planet after planet for Jedi, draining everything in sight to look for them, Treya and Sion had their own method for the Jedi Purge. When Darth Treya originally started the Sith Triumvirate, she had gone to the planet of Malachor V, the same one that had been devastated by the mass shadow generator on Revan's command. It was there where Treya found the Treyas Academy, an ancient Sith temple filled with corruptive dark side power ancient power. We plan on releasing a full video detailing everything about the Treyas Academy, but what you need to know for this holocron was that Revan had used it during the Jedi Civil War to turn his brethren to the dark side, giving him an instant loyal army. From then, Revan created the Order of Sith Assassins. These assassins were actually still around even after Revan was redeemed, remaining loyal to the Sith. But the cult had been forgotten on Malachor V, but that was until the Lady Darth Treya found them and seized control. The assassins would then be handed over to her apprentice Darth Sion, who essentially become the Vader to their Inquisitors. As Sion orchestrated a team of Sith assassins, specifically meant to hunt down and kill Jedi. It was theorized that Sion, before becoming a Sith Lord, had even been an assassin himself. The group dispatched themselves all over the galaxy to find and kill all Jedi survivors. This was an extremely chaotic time, as if the Jedi weren't leaving the Order, they were being killed in droves. And what's worse is that the Jedi Council had no idea who was hunting them. The Sith made sure of it. Finally, a single Jedi would commit an act, one which was meant to save the Order, but instead, one that would doom them. Master Atris would call a secret enclave together on the planet known as Qatar. These were the best and the brightest Jedi that still remained in the galaxy, and Atris promised them their safety. Atris had summoned them all there under the pretense of discussing a solution to destroy the Sith, but in actuality, she had gone behind her brethren's backs and were using them as bait to draw out Nihilus. The Jedi had leaked the information about the Jedi gathering to the wider galaxy, hoping to draw out this hidden enemy. But neither she nor any of the Jedi were prepared for the true might of the Sith Lord that appeared. Nihilus had grown so powerful that he was close to planet level. He consumed not only every Jedi at that meeting, but also the entire Merluka population of Qatar. Nihilus left only a single one of them alive in a new apprentice. Atrus managed to escape, and the only Jedi that were left would be the surviving members of the High Council. The Jedi of Rook Lamar, Kavar, Zezkael, and Lona Vash, all of whom made a pact to go into deep exile and preserve the Jedi Order. The Council had a plan. They wanted to lure the Sith into a false sense of security, hoping that with the Jedi gone, the Sith would reveal themselves, make them an easier target for the remaining Council members to strike. This would mark one of the darkest times in the galaxy, with the Jedi Order truly on the brink of extinction. The Sith Assassins continued to hunt Jedi wherever they could find them, but Sion and Nihilus made a critical mistake, betraying and casting out their master, the orchestrator of the entire Purge, Darth Treya. Sion and Nihilus were powerful, but Treya was the mastermind. Treya would then find the former Jedi Mitra Surik, who would take down every member of the Sith Triumvirate. Through Mitra Surik, the Jedi would survive, and although Treya had labeled Mitra the death of the Force, ended up bringing life back to it, fulfilling a greater destiny. This entire event mirrors a volcano, how it devastates a landscape, only for its ash to provide fertile soil from which a lush forest can grow. But we must point the finger at who is truly responsible for this event, Revan. It goes without saying that if it wasn't for Revan's actions, none of this could have set the stage for a Jedi Purge. Revan had done the right thing by taking on the Mandalorians when the rest of the Jedi refused, 
but in his journey, Revan was forced to cut moral corners to get the job done. He had toyed with the dark side until his mind was twisted by hatred for the Mandalorians. This led Revan to ordering the activation of the Mass Shadow Generator, resulting in the birth of Darth Nihilus. Then, he and Malak both ventured into the Unknown Regions, and would return as official Lords of the Sith. This resulted in another war that drastically weakened the Order, and set the stage for the Sith Triumvirate to take over. Most people give Revan a pardon for his actions, as Darth Revan and Revan are described as two separate people in some cases, something that is heavily disputed in the lore. But what is questionable to excuse is the newly redeemed Revan flitting back to the Unknown Regions, instead of attempting to rebuild the Jedi Order that desperately needed his help. Revan could have been this era's Luke Skywalker, but instead, he promised to hunt down and destroy the Sith, ironically setting the stage for the Sith to hunt and destroy the Jedi. After Revan returned, the Jedi acknowledged how powerful he was, but they also seeded a deep hatred for him. They were forced to offer him a seat on the council because of his knowledge and insight. Yet, Revan refused, sensing the Jedi's true feelings about the former Sith. In some circles of the Jedi, he was called Savior, but in most, he was known as a traitor. Although his actions may be justified, by attacking Vitiate's Sith Empire first, Revan was counting on the fact that Vitiate, sensing how weak the Republic was, would make a move. And with Vitiate's Sith Empire, they would have annihilated all of the Jedi and the Republic with ease. Having said that though, Revan still abandoned a Jedi Order and a Republic that were only barely holding themselves together, leaving them at the mercy of a planet-eating monster of Revan's own creation. But my friends, what this was, was the, the story of the Vampire Jedi. Greetings, Acolytes. We've been expecting you. Folklore is filled to the brim with tales of strange creatures and monsters in the night that hunt you for your blood. But for the galaxy of Star Wars, these tales of myth are all too real. Luckily for us, the Jedi Knights exist to defend the weak from such monsters of darkness, unless one of them were to become that such monster. Such was the tale of Tel Angor, the Force Vampire. Some of the monsters we are familiar with with our world exist in the galaxy far, far away as well, usually created as an abomination of the dark side. But the real tragedy of this tale is that the man who would become this abomination had done so in order to destroy such creatures of the dark side. So join us today as we venture into the blood-stained walls of the crypts and to examine the story of Tel Angor, the Jedi Vampire. Our story begins with several decades prior to the Clone Wars. The exact date is unfortunately not known, as all records have been expunged by the Jedi, hoping to cover up this great crime. At this time, there was a lesser known sect of the Jedi Order that called themselves the Order of the Silver Jedi. They were an entirely militaristic sect that devoted themselves to the complete eradication of the dark side in any form. The Silver Jedi served a similar purpose to that of the Jedi Shadows and the Jedi Sentinels, which went out to kill darksiders and retrieve dark side artifacts as their primary goal. However, the Order of the Silver Jedi were not beholden to the Jedi Council or the Council of First Knowledge like the Jedi Shadows were, and their devotion to destroying the dark side went far deeper than any other Jedi did. It seems to us that the Order of the Silver was something of an elitist club which only accepted the best and the brightest Jedi of an entire order. Many of the most prominent and talented members were a part of the Order of Silver, including the greatest Jedi Knight of that day, a Jedi by the name of Tel Angor. At this time, there was a wave of Dark Jedi beginning to surface across the stars, likely due to the rule of two trying to distract the Jedi during this time. Since they were in constant battle with beings of the Dark Side, the Jedi soon noticed that these beings were more able to use the Dark Side to bolster their strength than to worship it. Something that far surpassed the abilities granted by Force Valor, the Silver Jedi experienced that these creatures were something rare and that their potency in the Dark Side was not common even for extremely powerful Dark Jedi. It was clear that the Dark Side ruled them, but not in the form that the Silver Jedi were accustomed to. These beings were stronger and faster, and able to draw upon the dark side from a more destructive potency. This is the natural truth of the dual sides of the Force. The light side grants more life-giving abilities and Ulterian powers, and the dark side has larger displays of raw destruction and life-altering techniques. However, it seemed that the Order of the Silver Jedi did not accept this as fact and the duality of the Force, and soon they began experimenting with the ways to make their connection to the light side even stronger. Famously though, the Jedi Jedi High Council forbids Jedi to experiment with the Force as the Sith do, 
And this is exactly why, as we learn as we delve deeper into this story, experimentation for whatever reason always leads directly down the path to the darkness. But the Order of Silver had the best intentions. They just wanted to be better at their jobs and not be so disadvantaged when fighting dark side wielders. However, because of this, they became extremely dangerous as they fundamentally misunderstood the nature of the Jedi way. The Jedi High Council preaches that a Jedi should never attempt to use the Force to increase their own power, only their knowledge. Knowledge. Seeking power should be the last thing on a Jedi's mind. The Silvers soon tampered with the natural bond they all being shared with the Force, and actually found some success. The Silver Jedi's abilities seemed to be enhanced, and their powers were far more potent. But this was not enough for their order. In their haste to defeat the Dark Side once and for all, the Silver Jedi discovered what they thought to be a foolproof plan, although it was slightly dangerous, which was the means of fully opening oneself to the power of the Force, to let it flow through them openly like a reservoir. Tel Angor, a powerful and experienced Jedi Knight, volunteered for this experiment happily, as he was ordered to take at least a month in order to perfect his deep meditation. For four weeks, he fasted and concentrated on his connection to the Force in anticipation with completing this merge. Both the Jedi Order and Angor himself believed that he would be a living symbol of the light side, a glowing beacon of righteousness and justice, a new leader. Unfortunately for the Jedi, though, and the galaxy itself, the experiment backfired dramatically. Instead of drawing the Force in to bolster his abilities, the Jedi Angor was corrupted completely by the dark side once he opened himself up to the Force fully and turned into what is known as a Force Vampire, a being that fed on the Force and that needed it to survive. Think a lower scale Nihilus, much like Nihilus, but on a lesser scale since he was not a wound in the Force, as this Jedi soon came to life and the Vampire's first act was to feed on the Silver Jedi, those who had aided in this experiment followed by destroying all notes and computer data files that the vampire could find in relation to how he was created. From this point on, Tel Angor attacked any existence of the Jedi Order and the Silver Jedi that he could find deciding to hunt them to utter extinction. Immediately, Angor was aware of his supernatural new abilities. He was able to sustain himself by feeding on force energy present in all living things. He also learned that he would have to make physical contact with beings, and then he would be able to siphon every drop of power from their body. His prime targets were force wielders who had practiced their abilities, as this provided the most sustenance and the force energy was more potent and delicious. After that, simply force sensitives would serve. In a pinch, the vampire could even draw small amounts of energy from non-force sensitives, since the force resides in all living things in some measure. Any beings who were killed by this means that they would lose all their natural connection to the force, and even their dead bodies would exhibit no force sensitivity whatsoever. Life itself was ripped from them on a molecular level. This would leave the Jedi detectives absolutely baffled and horrified by the bodies left behind by this vampire. Tel Angor was able to transfer the force energy into pure your strength. This allowed him to always be a physical superior to anyone in a fight, and he could even bolster himself against injuries as well. The dark side granted the vampire with a secondary deadly ability, one where he could radiate waves of terror by resonating with the dark side itself. These waves caused such palpable fear in targets that victims felt debilitated and a level of pain that they had never experienced before. Victims killed through this power had looks of absolute terror etched in their faces at the time of their death. Unlike most vampires though, Tel Angor wasn't always able to rely on stealth, especially when he battled trained force wielders. He radiated like a walking dark side nexus, which could be easily sensed by anyone who used the force. He was a perversion of the very force itself. He he was not natural and had come out only through experimentation, one which could not be reversed or duplicated. Nothing was left of the once good man and Jedi who called himself Tel Angor, the beacon of light. All that remained was the dark side creature that he had become. The vampire rarely ever used his lightsaber ever again, as he's derived great enjoyment from killing his victims with his bare hands. He retained, though, all of his knowledge and skills of his former Jedi self, and this new state only enhanced his cunning and his valor. He grew into a vicious hunter, something that all Force sensitives feared would come for them in the night, as he was perpetually ravenous for their energy. 
Living on the fringes of the galaxy's populated areas for years, the vampire traveled from planet to planet by means of several passenger liners and unwary transport ships. He passed through the public unseen until the moment he decided to strike, and eventually, he grew to hate the light side that he had once served, and he allowed the dark side to corrupt him entirely. It took a great while, but the rest of the Jedi Order would finally discover what had happened, and they hunted down this man relentlessly as target number one. Unfortunately, whenever they discovered a lead as to where he was, all they discovered were corpses devoid of the Force. But at long last, just before the time of the Clone Wars began, a team of seven Silver Jedi, the last that remained of the Order, managed to locate Tel Angor. A great and a fiery battle ensued, but the vampire was finally captured. Instead of just killing him though, they imprisoned him on a cruiser, not knowing if he could be killed by conventional means, programming their cruiser to make continual automated jumps through hyperspace. The Silver Jedi held out hope that the good man of Tel Angor could be brought back to the Jedi way, so they decided to serve as the vampire's guardians, keeping him imprisoned until they could find a way to free him. But this would prove to be a terrible tragedy and mistake, as the vampire would kill again. Not long after their trip began, one of the Jedi made a critical error in the methods of containment, and Angor escaped. Angor quickly began to feed, and murder anyone he could locate. When it was finally down to the last member of the Silver Jedi, a Jedi Knight by the name of Bar Oplet, he managed to use his last moments of life to sabotage both the hyperdrive and the sublight drives to keep the vampire from escaping. Afterwards, the last Silver Jedi would die in a valiant stand against this dark side creature. But even though he had escaped, Angor was no less imprisoned than he had been before, as the ship exited hyperspace and floated there dead in space for decades on end. And with the last breath of the Silver Jedi, the vampire was imprisoned, but not forever. The years would crawl on, and so too would the Clone Wars, the rise of the Empire, and the fall after another galactic civil war. It would not be until the age of the New Republic before the cruiser was located in unknown space by a New Republic patrol. As the New Republic crew boarded the ship in order to investigate, the medic on the team who was force sensitive themselves immediately sensed the sickening presence of the being, but this was far too late. Famished for a meal, Angor pounced from the shadows and drained her of all her energy, then turning his sights on the rest of the crew. He completed his feast while mocking them for trying to defend themselves, calling himself the greatest Jedi who had ever lived. Using their ship, Tel Angor escaped and was unleashed yet again on the galaxy. He boarded a passenger freight and began to move amongst the stars as he once had long ago, hunting. The vampire managed to make at least four more stops before a team of investigators were called to track down and stop this killer. Though they did not know it was the force-sensitive vampire they were hunting and had very little information. One of these investigators though, who happened to also be a trained force wielder, examined the bodies and became uneasy due to the total and violent searing of the connections with the force with all of their corpses. The force-sensitive could not even sense any of the bodies and could only perceive them with his eyes. The vampire's plan was to reach the core world of Coruscant, the only remaining stronghold of the Order of the Silver Jedi, one that he planned to raid. He planned to destroy the final evidence of his existence after learning that there was a small group of Silver Jedi remaining, and with the Silver Jedi was the final piece that he had ever existed to begin with, a journal, one containing all the information of his creation and the story of the Silver Jedi. The very last entry would read this we never should have tried. Luckily though, the New Republic investigators caught up to the vampire in the stronghold and managed to take him down after a grueling final battle, as he was unable to destroy the final bit of evidence of his creation. And thus, the story of Tel Angor would come to an end. The Jedi Order carries many secrets they don't want revealed, and this is definitely one of them. It's not surprising that we've never heard of the Order of Silver Jedi before now, as it was clear that Tel Angor did everything he could to wipe all trace of their existence from all star maps so that no one would know who or what he really was. It's a shame and a tragedy that a man of righteousness and devotion against evil would become such a vile abomination in pursuit of the light side. Many ask why the Jedi didn't experiment with the Force like the Sith do, and this is a perfect example as to why. The Jedi know the secrets of life itself, as they serve the side of the Force that has everything to do with life. When the knowledge is used for power, only devastation lies in wait. I personally actually love this story a great deal, 
The Sith are always a cool read when it comes to the dark side and dark side based villains, but this offers a refreshing take on another dark side villain. A group of force vampires born from the dark side would definitely be a very interesting way to go. Star Wars is known for adapting different genres into the galaxy far, far away, so imagine a Dracula-like story with an old monster movie sort of vibe, or perhaps even just Van Helsing as a Jedi. Hunting down a dark side abomination. I have always felt that horror and Star Wars go masterfully together, and one day I would love to see a project revolving around the horror genre. But anyway friends, what made Darth Maul's ship the deadliest of its era? Greetings Acolytes, and welcome back to the Archives. Although seen only briefly, the Scimitar might be one of the most important ships of the Republic Classic era. Used by Maul during his apprenticeship under Sidious, the Scimitar was the perfect ship for someone of Maul's particular skill set. It was incredibly stealthy, highly experimental, fast, and horrific. For many, the Scimitar and its beauty would be the last thing that they ever saw. But what in particular made this ship so dangerous? It wouldn't be until after Maul's supposed death on Naboo that the Jedi would inspect the scimitar and find that it was riddled top to bottom with Sith technology. And not only that, but that the ship was also apparently alive, powered by the dark side itself. This makes the scimitar something of a prized Sith artifact, and the only one of its kind. So join us today as we analyze the ship that flew under everyone's radar and nearly made a member of the Jedi Council fall to the dark side. But before we begin, be sure to drop a comment letting us know if you enjoy these sort of breakdowns and want to see more in the future. And if you do, tell us what other pieces of the galaxy you'd like to see analyzed and explored. Now, onto the holocron of the Scimitar. The Scimitar itself has a history that predates its use by Maul. In Legends continuity, the ship hadn't originally been designed for Maul, but it was actually made for Sidious's predecessors. Many had thought that it had been built by the Wraith Sanar, the lead of the engineer and the founder of the Sanar design system. This was because it bore a striking resemblance to the armed star carrier ships designed by the Sanar system. While Wraith Sanar was no stranger to designing ships for Palpatine specifically, he actually denied involvement with the Scimitar. In actuality, it was designed and built by Rugress Gnome, better known as Darth Tenebris. Rugess was the alter ego of Tenebris, who was a successful tycoon that made a fortune building luxury starships. Despite the similarities to Sinar and its carriers, the Scimitar was actually manufactured to resemble the Sith infiltrators of the new Sith War era. In fact, a model that looked very similar to this was used by Darth Bane during his own life. The folding wings around a cockpit with a classic Sith design can actually be seen used as early as the Great Galactic War, and it would go on to be the inspiration behind the TIE Fighter's wings. The Scimitar was equipped with deadly weaponry, including six solar ionized cannons, and could fire rapid bursts in the blink of an eye. These cannon types produce high-powered ionized beams with enough heat to completely melt durasteel. This would enable the scimitar to completely disable or decimate any ships that are caught within its sights. This worked extremely well with how quick the ship could actually move and its maneuverability. Its sublight engines were the fastest of the time, being the highly experimental XC-2 Ion Drive Array, which despite being able to chase down and destroy any ship that it saw, it was unlikely that the pilot of the scimitar would even need to use its weapons. This was because the main feature of the Sith Infiltrator was its prototype cloaking device. Powered by an array of what is known as a Stygium Crystal, the cloaking device was the first of its kind for a ship of this size, being exceptionally small. It was able to produce a field that rendered the ship completely invisible both to the naked eye and even the most advanced of security technologies. The Stygium Crystals were historically used in other Sith technologies as well, and experimentation likely led to a perfect cloaking device or near perfect. To complete the insane stealth specs for the ship though, it was also complemented with a thrust trace dampener, which was a device that captured the ship's exhaust gases before releasing them into space, making the scimitar impossible to detect even through its engine exhaust. This is how Maul was able to slip in and out of any mission that he needed. The ship was literally designed for a pair of Sith Masters that would want to conduct clandestine dark side business and rituals. With all of this though, the ship itself was said to be valued at around 55 million credits. Designed by Tenebris, it had been a gift to his apprentice Plagueis, who would then use it until the very day that he died. Once Palpatine inherited the ship, 
he appreciated the craftsmanship, but didn't really have any use for it. He never went on these kinds of missions himself, and had many other crafts at his disposal. He viewed this as the weapon of an assassin. In Legends, Palpatine would decide to gift the ship to his apprentice and Maul once the Zabrak had proved himself worthy in training, and although the ship would technically belong to Darth Plagueis, it was Maul's to command, the greatest gift of his entire life. But this was all a play by Sidious, to keep Maul dependent on his approval by spoiling him with rewards for good work, but punishing him severely for bad behavior. This was a sick masterclass of manipulation to keep the Sith assassin loyal and devoted to Sidious. But of course, even Plagueis believed that Palpatine spoiled his apprentice too much, and this caused Maul to gain an ego. But it was for one of these such occasions that Palpatine gifted him the scimitar, and Maul was overcome with such gratitude and great appreciation of the beauty and power of this new ship. Whenever he met his end on Naboo though, the scimitar came into possession of the Republic, and they would keep it in a secret hangar on Naboo for a short period of time. All after the analysis crews of the Republic tried to send in the ship would be killed by the scimitar's internal defense systems. So the Jedi Order decided to have their lead starship expert, Seisei Tin, run his own diagnostics. And what the Jedi Master found was so terrifying that it shook him to his core. The following message was sent by Master Master Tin to the High Council. Greetings, Master Yoda. The vehicle that delivered the Sith Lord to Naboo has been secured. It does not surprise me that the ship was designed to kill intruders, but given its contents, it seems strange that it did not self-destruct when its own had failed to return. The ship's exterior bears a striking resemblance to an experimental Sanar design system's armed star carrier, but every aspect of the vessel is either heavily modified or prototypical. It was equipped with a built-in cloaking device, and I've confirmed that the device is fueled by Stygium crystals. Various weapons and devices indicate that this is Sith technology. All the ship's records have been wiped clean, and I have found nothing to identify the Sith Lord slain by Obi-Wan. Although I have disabled the ship's weapon systems, I am compelled to say that it still poses a great danger, and I recommend that this vessel be placed in the Jedi Council's care. That ship is alive with the dark side, Master Yoda. I feel it clinging to my robes, and worse, it still tempts me, calling me back with promises of fantastic journeys to the far reaches of the galaxy and space. That ship is alive. What a chilling sentence and statement by Master Tin. The ship was so potent in the dark side that it almost had a mind, much like a kyber crystal does. And even though Seisei only interacted with the ship once, he mentioned that it tempted him. It called out to him to take it, go off on adventures in the great unknown. Sith technology is treacherous, which is something we know about when it comes to the holocrons, amulets, and other types of artifacts. But it's not something that we often think of when it comes to entire vessels. Rather than be outright hostile to the Jedi Master, the Scimitar could sense that Master Tin knew more about any ship than anyone on the Council, and it attempted to seduce him. Very few Jedi would likely be tempted by the idea of adventure and excitement among the stars. Even Master Yoda said such things a Jedi should not care for. But Seisei Tin had perfected his own precognition to where he was the finest pilot of the Jedi Order. He had a connection with starships that may have only been matched or rivaled by Anakin Skywalker. And speaking of Anakin, it is a very good thing that he never came into contact with the Scimitar. Otherwise, I would be inclined to say that he would not be able to resist the Scimitar's enticement, its promise of exciting journeys through the galaxy. The fact that Sith technology is able to go so far as to corrupt someone just by having them pilot a ship makes it wildly dangerous and even more intriguing. But anyway, my friends and acolytes, this was why Darth Maul's ship was the most dangerous of the Republic classic era. Sith technology is a rare and a dying breed of knowledge. Even though Sidious and Vader would go on to use inspiration from it in the Empire's exploits, these were again just inspirations and homages to the past. But when a Dark Lord unashamedly merges technology with the dark side, an entirely new kind of power is unlocked. Sith scientists of the past have experimented with such things, such as the Sith Lady Belia Darzu, who invented the Technovirus. But anyway, my friends, when venturing you... out into deep space, one's mind may be on their destination or the glory of their quest. Little thought is ever given to the traveling side of things besides ensuring that there is enough fuel and food on the ship to get you to your next destination. 
But there are certain areas in deep space where one must remain extremely vigilant. Just because you are surrounded by the vast expanse of space does not mean that you are alone. There are many strange and even horrifying creatures that exist in deep space, and even some that can find you in hyperspace. Today, Acolytes, we are going to once again be talking about the dangers of the Star Weirds, phantoms of space known to attack ships seemingly at random. This is a subject we've covered in the archives before, but since they're relatively new and debuted recently in canon, there's been more information to discuss surrounding them. Along with this, there's also emerged some misconceptions and outright false information that we want to quickly clear up about the Star are weirds. So lock in your hyperspace coordinates and make sure your blasters are loaded because now we're making the jump to deep space. A star weird is a type of phantom-like creature that can only be encountered within deep space in the unknown wilds. While rare, encounters with these ghosts are always traumatizing, if not outright deadly. Those that survive these encounters rarely depart with their sanity. These creatures appear as impossibly tall humanoids, so gaunt as to be nearly skeletal. Their white hair is long and wild, floating around its head even within the artificial gravity of a spaceship. It does wear clothes in the form of rags that seem to just hang in strips from their cadaverous arms. As far as the face goes, it apparently differs in appearance to whoever is looking directly at a star weird, though a common description is that the face almost resembles that of the viewer. However, the faces of the star weird are described as desiccated and rotting, but again, Sometimes star weirds can appear as a rotting, decaying corpse of your own body, a dark mirror. The face of a star weird is accompanied by a wide mouth full of sharp teeth and eerie glowing eyes. Its hands are long and bony tipped with black taloned fingers. The image of horror is completed by the fact that they do not walk, but they rather float around in a spectral fashion. Star weirds also never speak and possess no known language. The star weird may just be the single deterrent to ever venturing out into deep space, especially due to their powers and their behavioral patterns. There are no specific areas that they reside in and unknown, making encounters possibly literally anywhere in deep space. These ghostly ghouls can survive in a vacuum, and apparently even within hyperspace. Oftentimes they attack spacers repairing damage to the hull of their ships, or even will manifest aboard the ships themselves, even traveling through hyperspace. A star weird usually floats in place, and will stalk its victim for some time, only attacking once they are looked upon. But immediately once an attack begins, they begin to unleash a telepathic banshee wail, one that echoes in the vacuum of space. Most that hear these ghostly screams put them in a state of panic. Those that do not immediately run will be attacked by the ghost's sharp claws. But for a strange reason, star weirds have a strong hatred for those that can use the force, as they will single-mindedly attack them, ignoring all others around. But that there are non-force sensitives around, a star weird would choose one victim to lock onto and attack. Although to this day, how one incurs a star weird's wrath remains completely unknown. Unfortunately, fighting one of these things is not straightforward either. Since they are incorporeal, they cannot really be harmed by any physical weaponry. Though it seems lightsabers, blasters, and anything kyber related has at least a 50-50 chance of harming a star weird. But what's terrifying is that their claws only affect living tissue, so they bypass any armor when they attack, cutting deeply into one's flesh. Their physiology is not well understood either, as they are known to vanish spontaneously. But what is known is that a star weird can be touched by the Force, and that the Force does affect them. All this has convinced most Jedi scholars that star weirds are physical manifestations of the literal dark side of the Force, though very little evidence has supported this claim, and this is mainly a theory among the Jedi Order. But still, this prospect is fascinating. The idea that the dark side itself has created these creatures that reside in dark space. Star weirds can also use the Force themselves, which of course makes sense. They are known for being able to use force choke, telepathy, summon force lightning, and can even drain the life out of victims with their power. However, recently in canon, when Luke was attacked by a star weird, he stated that he couldn't feel any movements in the force, leading many to speculate that the star weirds can actually control gravity. Star weirds have only ever been seen twice in all of the lore, canon, and legends combined. And this is where the big
big misunderstanding lies that we mentioned earlier about these creatures. Star Weirds were first created for the Star Wars role-playing game and are detailed in totality in a source book, one called Ultimate Adversaries. This is a very small story in which that they appeared in the Old Republic fact files, and they make their only appearance in an actual story in the canon Dr. Aphra comics from the year 2020. There is false information going around right now that Darth Vader was afraid of them and that he couldn't kill them, or rather, that the Star Weirds feared Lord Vader, and the Emperor Palpatine had been preparing for them in an invasion from deep space. Although this admittedly sounds interesting, it has completely no basis in either legends or canon, and was actually created purely by using AI, and after that was shared around as fact. While this may not be a very big deal to some, we did feel it necessary to mention that these stories did not take place in Legends or Canon. And unfortunately, as of right now, Vader nor Palpatine has ever mentioned the Star Weirds, or much less encountered one. But let's go back to Canon and the story that we do have. In Doctor Aphra 2020 33 through 34, at some point during or prior to the Clone Wars, we learned that Ala Sakura and Shock T were able to locate the position of a Star Weird that was threatening the civilian population of an of an Outer Rim world. This specific Star Weird was extremely powerful, with its presence rippling through the Force. Ayla Sakura even called it a planet eater, suggesting that it was so powerful that it could consume a planet if it chose to. However, it isn't certain whether or not Ayla was speaking literally, as the Star Weird doesn't display this kind of power to suggest that this feat is possible. It's likely, however, meant to be metaphorical and theoretical, since it could consume the life force of any individual, possibly leading it to destroy a planetary population. We're not convinced that a single Star Weird has Nihilus level power, otherwise the Council would have dispatched not just two Jedi Jedi Masters there, but maybe even gone as an entire Jedi Council. But moving on, in the story we learned that Ayla Sakura and Shock T were not powerful enough to destroy the Star Weird, and therefore attempted to trap it. They would eventually be successful, trapping it at the Saisen Temple, a Jedi structure almost entirely made of crystal. It was within this temple that the two Jedi planned to trap the Star Weird using the power, and a Jedi artifact known as Kaithu's Bell. The bell itself was only a magnifier, as there was an orb within it that acted as an emitter of sound. As long as this Jedi bell continued to ring, the sound would reverberate off the crystal walls of the entire temple, keeping the Star Weird contained in a sort of stasis. The two Jedi informed the population that if they ever heard the bell stop ringing, that they must evacuate the entire planet immediately, leading to the idea that a Star Weird could be a planetary threat at some point. Many years would pass, well into the Great Galactic Civil War, when Dr. Aphra is looking for the emitter within Kaithu's belt. She enlists the help of none other than Luke Skywalker in order to get inside the Jedi Temple. Neither of them were aware of the temple's true purpose though, as the recordings that Shock T and Ayla Sakura had left behind had been damaged and they were not able to relay all the vital information. The two of them avoided the temple's traps, but destroyed Kaithu's belt when trying to retrieve the magnifier. This ultimately set the Star Weird free from its prison, and of course, it immediately attacked them, letting out a horrifying scream. Luke and Aphra were pinned upside down against the crystalline walls, with Luke unable to save them with the Force. Right before the two of them were crushed under the Planet Eater's power, none other than R2-D2 zapped it in the foot which distracted the creature long enough, and Luke and Aphra were released. Due to Aphra's cybernetic implants, she was able to accidentally activate the emitter, which released a sound that briefly held the Star Weird in place. After she deduced the artifact's true function, along with that of the temple, the emitter inexplicably turned off, setting the Star Weird free yet again. The two managed to make a run after Luke impaled it with a broken shard of the temple, and from here, they both used the reflection of the crystal walls, along with the holograms of Shock T and Ayla Sakura to confuse the creature as it chased them. On the Outer Rim Terrace, while their ship was located, they had a final battle as Aphra used Luke Skywalker's destroyed lightsaber, or partially destroyed lightsaber, to cut off the apparition's hand showing that it can be affected by a lightsaber. Once they were in their ship and attempted to leave, the Star Weird still followed them, enraged and planning to totally destroy the two of them for their insolence. But Luke, with the bell's emitter in his hand, focused on the Force, hoping that something would happen. His Skywalker bloodline and potential absolutely shone through in this moment, as the artifact emitted such a powerful sound that it picked up a cyclone of Force energy, as the whirlwind of light side power was so strong that it ripped the Star Weird apart in totality. The Jedi considered the Star Weirds to be such a threat that they were hunted to near extinction. 
This is what happened in Legends when the Jedi Council encountered the Star Weird Queen. There is very little information about this event, as it only exists in the Old Republic fact file. But according to this report, at some point during the Great Galactic War, around 3,681 years before the Battle of Yavin, the Star Weird Queen apparently had decided to annihilate the Jedi, and then move on to destroying all Force Sensitives. For the first time in history, the mysterious culture of the Star Weirds was revealed now that the Queen herself had made a grand appearance, leading her haunted army. She attacked and attempted to kill the majority of the Jedi High Council, along with a Padawan by the name of Zerender. However, during the skirmish, she was killed by a Jedi Master, a Jedi by the name of Wyelet, who sacrificed himself to save both the Council and his young Jedi Padawan. The circumstances and exactly what happened in this battle specifically is completely and unfortunately unknown to us. But apparently, this one Jedi Master destroyed the Star Weird Queen, which caused the rest of the Star Weirds to disperse into deep space. It's really disappointing that an event this important doesn't have a lot of information on it, or at least some sort of deeper presence in the lore. But nevertheless, this was our only peek behind the curtain at what drives the strange and demented creatures known as the Star Weirds, though their reason for doing what they do remains a mystery. But anyway, friends, this is pretty much everything there is to know about the Star Weirds, including legends and canon. These creatures seem like such an incredible piece of lore with a lot of potential, but it's a shame how underutilized they are. Just a single one is a threat to an entire group of Jedi, and some of them apparently are so powerful that they can consume planetary populations. If we are to take what Aayla Sakura said at face value, of course. But you what tell us the underworld of the capital planet of Coruscant to literally become a nightmarish hellscape. Greetings, acolytes, and welcome back to the archives. Coruscant, the capital of the Grand Republic, and the beacon of metropolitan advancement for the entire galaxy. We have known this planet to lie at the very epicenter of the hyperlane convergence, making it the perfect hub for the Republic itself. It is where the Senate convenes and the Jedi Temple rests. It's the kind of place where every being in the galaxy dreams of making it big. It is a planet of dreams, corruption, and nightmares. Even the most fabulous of the elite still have difficulty buying in and renting out places that they want to go on Coruscant. It is a planet which is now entirely made up of a pure cityscape. But that's all on the surface. The surface world of Coruscant and what lies beneath are two diametrically opposed things. We got to see a little bit of what the mid-surface levels were like during the Clone Wars, a crime-ridden, unsavory place filled with all kinds of scum and villainy, all of which culminates down in the infamous level 1313. But what lies even further beneath? What is Coruscant like in the places where the sun never shines, the levels so deep that they have become buried and forgotten by the rest of the galaxy? Well, my friends, that is what we are going to explore in today's holocron, so make sure your blaster has a fresh power pack within it, because you're going to need it as we descend into the depths of Coruscant. Before we begin, though, our scanners have detected something concerning. Many of the acolytes that have visited our archives have not yet subscribed to our channel, so if you've been enjoying the daily Star Wars lore, reach out and crush that subscribe button. It is your destiny. But now, back to the ugliness of the lower levels. The entire world of Coruscant is covered in city. From ancient times until now, the denizens of the capital would never tear down any structure to make them new. Instead, once the Coruscant city took up every inch of the planet's surface, the dwellers simply began building on top of it. This is why places in the city are referred to as levels, since each level and layer is just a new part of the city built upon the old. Those that were wealthy enough to ascend to or live in the upper parts of the city did so, and everyone else that was less fortunate were abandoned and left behind. This would continue for thousands of years, with Coruscant being in an ever-present state of construction. Billions of beings traveled to the capital world every year, and so, with the population increasing, so did the levels of the massive city. Each level is numbered by how many layers it is from the bottom, with the highest and most elite point of Coruscant currently being level 5127. And this is what makes the city planet a breathtaking entity much like the ocean, because as you descend deeper into Coruscant, it becomes darker and stranger with every passing level. It becomes more hostile, more bizarre. You've likely come across whispers and rumors of level 1313, which is supposedly the most dangerous level on Coruscant that one can reach by normal means. This place is known for its rampant crime, 
and the fact that it's completely under control of the Black Sun Syndicate. 1313 is a lawless place where the police force and even the Coruscant Guard do not bother visiting, likely fearing for their own safety. Only Jedi, extremely notable bounty hunters, and members of the Black Sun can properly find their way through this level effectively, and even for them, it's dangerous. The most infamous part of this part of the city is the Black Market Trading Center, where one can buy illegal weapons such as a displacer gun and even old lightsabers, with the Jedi notably despising this practice. The Jedi Order has even made efforts to shut this down, but tackling all of level 1313 is too costly for the Jedi Order's time and resources, so the Jedi just track down leads where they can and shut them down as they go. However, the crime on this level has spiraled out of control, as the denizens have realized just how much the surface has forgotten about them and left them behind to rot. They have formed their own government under the Black Sun, and every being does what is right in their own eyes for the fate of survival. The reason this has happened is because many beings come to Coruscant seeking the dream life, luxury, wealth, greed. But then, once they find out just how expensive the surface is, they are forced into the underlevels. There, they eventually get buried under more and more city, resulting in them going to crime in order to stay alive. But this is only level 1313. What happens when you decide to take that one dilapidated elevator that goes even lower? What is the absolute hell that awaits you in the bottom 1,000 levels? What is at the very bottom of the corrupted greed, wealth, gluttony? Where does it all end? Or rather, where does it all begin? The capital of Coruscant grew so large that the bottommost levels were literally closed off from the surface, and the denizens that were trapped in the darkness are left there to rot eternally. This is the true Coruscant underworld, a place that never saw the light of day. The bottom 1000 were all in what was basically a big canyon filled with garbage and debris. Due to the canyon's enclosure by the larger buildings, the air was trapped and created a microclimate at least three layers deep. The trapped moisture caused rainstorms and convective wind patterns within the canyon floor, making the underworld like its own small planet. And it might as well be a completely different planet anyway, as it housed a larger population than many star systems did. Billions upon billions of beings were beyond the protection of the world's security force, leaving them at the mercy of gangs, thugs, exploiters, and of course, man-eating vermin, which we'll explore further in just a moment. The underworld was extremely dark, lit only by artificial light either from technology or natural fungi. It was loud, the air being filled with the banging and clanging of machinery, giving power to the more well-to-do surface dwellers. One might say the unique thing about the bottom 1000 is that maybe some are in touch with the natural surface of Coruscant as it once was. Unfortunately though, that is not the case. Not much is known about level 1 or any of the levels near it even but they are considered utterly uninhabitable. They are covered by a thick layer of garbage, thousands of years of it dumped from the surface. But this isn't household trash. It functions as the Republic's waste bin. During the era of the Empire, one could find entire Venator-class Star Destroyers lying nose down in trash heaps, laying there in the underworld. Along with this, every living thing was constantly exposed to the pollution, sewage, and even reactor radiation. Needless to say, disease ran rampant, and the poor people who had to live in this place only wished that they could be on level 1313, because at least up there, they wouldn't have to deal with the creatures. The biggest problem with the underlevels was not the crime or even having to scavenge for food. It was the disgusting and horrific mutants which dwelt in the darkness, all of them just as hungry as the unfortunate residents. Such monsters were termed as the corridor ghouls, mutated canine-like creatures with pale skin and appeared to hunt in packs. And then you had the hive rats which were giant man-eating rodents that could grow up to nine feet long, with bodies covered in tumors and sores. The only thing pleasant about the hive rats to the underdwellers was the fact that they preyed upon the Duracrete slugs. These were parasite mollusks that dug their tunnels into the building foundations, feeding off of the Duracrete within. This was then excreted from their skin, forming armor. They could grow up to 32 feet long, 
and if not kept in check, they caused all kinds of structural damage to the already unstable buildings in the underworld. But probably one of the most disturbing predators of this world would be the Kuthons. In appearance, the Kuthons resembled decaying corpses, with loose flaps of flesh, stringy, dirty hair, and lipless mouths filled with sharp teeth. Skin grew to cover the eyes, and there was an egg-like organ where the eye should have been, moving restlessly, sealed within its sockets. These creatures craved flesh as their main diet, and unlike many things in the underworld, we actually do know where these awful beings came from, but it doesn't give us comfort. Their ancestors were humans who were banished from the surface for their crimes, subsequently residing in the darkness of the Undercity for thousands of years. This genetically changed them into these horrific creatures that became the subject of countless horror stories and nightmares. But these stories were real. But there is even more than this believed to be extinct. There were a species of monsters known as the Teozin, which resided in the very lower levels. The Teozin was a gigantic centipede-like creature capable of spitting red webbing to entrap its prey. They could grow up to 64 feet long, roughly 20 meters, and had a translucent shell which was capable of diffusing energy. This made them nearly completely impervious to blasters or even lightsaber blades. To top it all off, the Teozin were force sensitive and capable of cloaking themselves in the force so that they could not be sensed. Darth Maul would encounter one while in the underlevels of Coruscant, and he described attempting to sense it as almost like encountering a surface, one so slick that one could not find a grip to hold on to. But now, we have one final creature in the lower levels that we want to talk about, a monster whose name has yet to be revealed and who we aren't sure of just yet. The monster appears in exactly two panels of the Star Wars 2020 comic run. Here, when Lando, Chewbacca, and Nia Nub were in the Falcon and on the run from the TIE Fighters after pulling a rebel attack on Coruscant, the Empire chases them down into the underlevels of the city where the Falcon just barely escaped being swallowed whole, one easily the size of an Exogorth. It had giant tentacles and teeth the length of the falcon itself. Its hide was thick, and it didn't even flinch when a TIE fighter crashed right into the side of its mouth. It feels insane that a monster easily the size of two Star Destroyers actually lives beneath the city of Coruscant, proving the underlevels of the city are truly a nightmare realm. So my friends, the this is planet the of Coruscant is easily one of the most interesting places in all of the lore. What many people do not know is that Coruscant is actually roughly the size of Earth. However, unlike Earth, Coruscant roughly has 3 trillion members of its population. Despite an official census that was taken just following the Clone Wars, which put the number at roughly 1 trillion. However, many believe that this number was incorrect. The census that was taken actually did not include temporary workers, transients, unregistered residents, or people living in other orbital facilities. This would put it roughly around 430 times Earth's current population as of 2024. Roughly 70% of Coruscant is made up of humans. In fact, humans are believed to have originated from Coruscant, and the other 30% is known as other sentient life forms. However, exactly how this is classified is unclear. Something interesting about Coruscant is how it is viewed by the Greater Republic. Many believe that it is the core of the government. It is not a place to be vacationed, sunbathed, or a location that is worth sightseeing. It is a place of pure business. Its environment is extremely unique, as it is made up of orbital mirrors, which were set up that would reflect the sun's warmth and life, reflecting it back at Coruscant during daylight hours. In Legends continuity, Coruscant actually did have naturally occurring storms, with it being recorded in the year 3 ABY that there were thunderstorms and rain on the city planet. However, in canon, the weather is artificially maintained meaning everything was either controlled centrally by the Republic or by the Empire. Coruscant originally had a big problem. Its sun was not very large, which meant that the planet was not particularly habitable, and many species could not naturally live there. Coruscant also ran into a different problem, as its gigantic buildings created unusual and unpredictable microclimates, which caused varying degrees of temperature and air pressure between the higher and the lower altitudes within the tallest of Coruscant's buildings. When it came to air, there was a different problem. The upper levels of Coruscant were of course filtered, 
but there are 5,000 plus levels on the city planet. Essentially, the higher up you lived was marked by your air quality. The rich, the influential, and the wealthy had near perfect air. However, those that were left in the undercity, buried and forgotten, leveled by the trillions of pounds of waste that Coruscant produces every single day. The air was considered to be barely breathable. Toxic fumes produced by millennia of the planet-wide cityscape's vehicle and factory waste. All of that compounded on the poor. Many of the most influential and richest citizens didn't even breathe air at all, but rather, a form of purified gas was their preference. Many people would even bring their own private air supply, not trusting the conditions of Coruscant. But there was yet another problem. The countless life forms produced a massive amount of carbon dioxide and heat. Because of this, Coruscant required thousands of atmospheric dampeners, those that were stationed in the atmosphere in order to prevent it from falling apart completely. Initially, this was developed by the Galactic Republic and was known as the Coruscant Atmospheric Reclamation Project. Those that lived above were terrified of those that lived below. They were cannibalistic criminals. In fact, many of them had been banished there hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. They had grown into monstrosities, mutants, and they were extremely dangerous. But there was something deep within Coruscant that the people needed, and that was the power relay. Stations deep within Coruscant were billions upon billions of pounds of debris that was previously buildings lay. Their foundations cracked, housing rats, mutants of different varieties, and yet still distributing power to the surface of the world. Life on Coruscant varies drastically. Many believe it is the place of democracy and only a place of the rich. However, it also houses the most dangerous people in the entire galaxy. Those criminals typically flee to the lower levels, the lowest of which this is still accessible to this day being level 5. The reason for this is it has been said that the Republic, and then later the Empire, did not exist in the lower levels of Coruscant. And there were popular bars and other shady locations, including black markets, where the most dangerous villains in the galaxy would gather. The only place that they were welcome because essentially, it was truly lawless. A place extremely close to the galactic government, and yet, no government existed at all. But there were still despicable things that went on closer to the surface. Just below the middle class of Coruscant lie the gangs, the mafia, and warfare. Criminal syndicates like the Black Sun ruled large portions of territory in the Coruscant underworld. Here, they could smuggle their drugs freely, close to the surface, yet abiding by the lawlessness that lay below. Just below the surface was nearly entirely run by gangs. The absolute saddest fact about Coruscant is that we only see the 1% of the 1% in film, in animation most of the time. We only explore the levels of Coruscant that are populated by the wealthy. Not only the normally wealthy, but the absurdly wealthy. Most individuals on Coruscant lived an absolutely horrid life. They breathed subpar air. They were literally buried by the trash of those more fortunate than them. Another fascinating part of Coruscant's history is its transition under the Galactic Empire, which we actually get a pretty good look at in the canon Tarkin novel. There, it says this. He had heard that one needn't have been absent from Coruscant for years to be startled by the changes. Each day saw buildings raised, demolished, incorporated into even larger and taller monstrosities, or merely stripped of Republic-era ornamentation, or renovated in accordance with a more severe aesthetic. Curved lines were wielding to harsh angles, sophistication to declaration. Fashions had changed along with similar lines, with few outside the imperial court affecting cloaks, head clothes, or garnish robes. By most accounts, though, Coruscanti were very satisfied, especially those who lived and worked in the upper tiers, the tiers of the fathomless cityscape, content that for no other reason to have had the brutal war behind them. The people of the upper levels were healthy, wealthy, and happy. Even after the Empire rose, things didn't really change all that much on Coruscant, at least not at first. But what did change was the alien species living below Coruscant. They were now viewed as pariah, as the Empire pushed an anti-alien sentiment, making Coruscant a dangerous place for many species in the galaxy. What had once been a grand melting pot now served as a warning, at least to those on the upper levels. 
However, the lower levels remained much the same. Palpatine found himself somewhat disinterested with what went on below him. And if they could not benefit him and did not hamper him, why would he mind? The Senate had not minded the existence of those less fortunate for hundreds of years. In Legends continuity, many of the criminal syndicates actually found their way to the upper levels of the city after the Empire fell, and the government crumbled before their eyes. So, at the, the end like of the era known as the Old Sith Wars, Exar Kun spearheaded what would be one of the greatest Jedi wars ever fought against any Sith. Exar, Ulic Keldroma, and the dark side cult known as the Krath, as well as the Mandalorian Crusaders all came together to wage a conflict that nearly drove the Jedi to extinction. Though the Jedi won, it came at the cost of their homeworld, as well as the Great Library of Ossus, and the very structural integrity of the Jedi Order. The year was 3,995 BBY when the fighting finally stopped, and Exar Kun was defeated. However, the Sith's influence still permeated through the galaxy in the form of Sith war beasts. Exar Kun, using the knowledge of Naga Sadao, and the Lima Kido both used the alchemy that they had discovered to create abominations of nature, such as the Cylon, the War Worms, and most notably, the Tarentitex. This would spark an event known as the Great Hunt, in which the Jedi Order would fan out across the galaxy, with the single goal to exterminate all traces of these Sith monsters. In today's Holocron, we are going to talk all about the Great Jedi Hunt, the beast that they fought, and how it came to an abrupt and a violent end. The Great Hunt was organized by the Jedi Council of this year, just one year after the ending of the Great Sith War. Though the Jedi Order was considerably weaker, they could not allow the creatures that Exar Kun and his followers had created to be left alive and wreak havoc. Monsters empowered by the dark side were a threat to anyone and everyone, especially those that could use the Force. We've talked extensively about the Tarentitex on the channel before, but they were essentially smaller versions of the Rancor, with larger claws and jaws, spikes all over their back, and two tusks on either side of their mouth. They secreted a deadly venom, were resistant to the Force, and fed on the blood of Force sensitives. While under the control of the Sith, these creatures were used as both defensive measures to their tombs and hordes, as well as attack units to be unleashed on the battlefield. Once Exar Kun was killed though, the Tarentitex were essentially roaming free without anyone keeping them in check. They were killing essentially anything that they came across, and it was the duty of the Jedi to put an end to this. The other notable abomination was known as the War Worm. These creatures date all the way back to the Twelve Dark Jedi, as well as Sorza's Sin. It is believed that this Dark Jedi is the one that created them. This tradition would later be carried on most famously by Naga Sadao, who kept a War Worm in his temple on Yavin 4. Which of course, this would end up contributing to Exar Kun's fall to the dark side. The War Worms were giant serpent-like creatures with, sp with spikes across the length of their back. They had huge fanged teeth and at the smallest, they were the size of an average building. But at the largest, they could reach the length of the tallest Coruscant Spire. But despite their size, they were also incredibly nimble. Even deadly enough, the Exar Kun took great care when approaching them. Interestingly, the War Worms actually served little purpose in the Sith Empire, as they had been a side effect in Sith Alchemy. Alchemy had altered the bodies of the asteroid-dwelling Exogorths, which were the large similar to the one in Empire, they almost ate the Millennium Falcon. But one of the most horrific of these Sith beasts was known as the Cylon. It's difficult to describe exactly what these things were, as we only see part of them in a single comic book appearance. Our only appearance of the Cylon comes from Star Wars Tales No. 1, Life, Death, and the Living Force. In this issue, a Padawan Obi-Wan Kenobi and a Jedi Master Qui-Gon Jinn come across a slumbering beast on the world of Arua. Qui-Gon believed that it had been the will of the Force for them to find one of the last remaining Sith war beasts, since its very existence was an affront to the living force. The monsters are aggressive and bloodthirsty. They are living in constant pain. Their bodies have been twisted beyond what is natural. The Cylons resemble Sarlaccs and live in large earthen structures. They are gargantuan mass mouths and tentacles, no apparent coherency to their biology. And unfortunately, this Sith war beast is one that we know the least about. But while these war beasts were a problem, the Tarentitech was a new level threat entirely. The War Worms never really ventured out where they were originally placed, and the Cylon were apparently very easy to kill despite their appearance. Qui-Gon and the young Obi-Wan were able to take one out rather quickly, and didn't even seem all that tired. It was the Tarentitex, though, that terrorized the galaxy. They posed the most threat directly to the Jedi Order. 
entire groups of Jedi would go missing when hunting down Torrent attacks. Killing any Sith war beast was monumental, as the Sith would alchemically optimize the creatures to become perfect killing machines. As a result, the Jedi would devise teams of consisting of powerful warriors, hunters, and Jedi who could influence the minds of the Torrent attack coordinated attacks. Using this method, the Jedi would go on for the Great Hunt, and the hunt would last around three years. Over this hunt, the Jedi would cleanse the worlds of Tython, Onderon, Yavin 4, Kashyyyk, Tatooine, and even Korriban. While this resulted in the near total extinction of the Torrent attacks, the Great Hunt was not entirely successful, as it diminished and dwindled away Jedi resources drastically. The hunts of Kashyyyk and Korriban were complete failures, and many Jedi were killed in the ensuing battle. This specific event would mark the official end of the Great Hunt, as it was told to us in Star Wars Tales No. 23. The story focuses on a team of well-accomplished Jedi, including a Twi'lek by the name of Gunhan Serish, a noble Jedi who was staunchly believing in the Jedi way and held strict to the code, one who was willing to do literally anything to serve the cause. Instead of choosing a lightsaber, the Twi'lek Jedi was one of the few that only wielded a force-imbued sword, and even used a bow. Shayla Nur was another Jedi, the apprentice of the famous Jedi Master, Ud Banar, and the wielder of the Solari Kyber Crystal. The Solari was known to only function of those that were pure of spirit, and devoted to the light side. And then you have the other Jedi, Duron Keldroma, the cousin and the last living relative of Ulit Keldroma. Keldroma was in a relationship with Sheala, the Jedi of their team responsible for influencing the mind of the Torrent attack. This hunting team was the best of the best, but they would soon meet their ultimate challenge. Upon being summoned to Onderon by the High Council, the group was given a secret mission that was off the books. Officially, the Great Hunt had concluded two days earlier. But after three years of hunting the beasts, it had taken so much of a toll on the Jedi resources that the hunt was deemed too dangerous to continue. However, the High Council had selected this team of Jedi for a special mission to Korriban. On Korriban, there was supposedly a large and a dangerous Torrent attack from which the Sith Academy had been using to study. The Jedi were to infiltrate Korriban and kill the beast there. And although the Council wanted to send more Jedi with them, the Senate had specifically requested only a small number of Jedi be chosen. Interestingly, despite the Jedi trying to erase all traces of Exar Kun's legacy, they never did directly attack the Sith Academy on Korriban. And currently in the lore, we don't know why. But our best guess is, was that at the time the Jedi Order was not strong enough, and they simply did not know what sort of threats loomed deep within the Academy. For the longest time, it was forbidden for the Jedi to step foot on Korriban. The entire planet permeated with the dark side, and threatened to corrupt even the most pure of heart. This was the reason why the Senate requested only three Jedi be sent, as they wanted to minimize the risk of any of them falling to the dark side. Our team of Jedi would actually feel the pull as soon as they touched down in what is known as the Dress Day Settlement. In order to get more information about the Torrent attack, they were forced to rely on local contacts. Of course, any being that decides to do business on Korriban has no good intentions. And so, the Jedi found themselves making a spice run, doing it for smugglers in order to get information. Meanwhile, the Jedi by the name of Gun Han attempted to seduce and sleep with a Sith apprentice in order to get more information about the Academy. But while there, Keldroma began to receive terrible visions seeing the rise of Darth Malak and the return of the Sith, visions granted by Korriban. The world had already done something to the Jedi. They had compromised their moral codes within a week. The three Jedi were also beginning to fight amongst themselves. Gun Hand heavily criticized his two comrades for being in a relationship, believing that it made his friends weak and unfocused. He was concerned that he could not trust them if they could not keep their passion in check. He feared that they would fall prey to the dark side, especially on Korriban. However, the two Jedi believed that he was being arrogant and self-righteous, but Keldroma promised that he would not trust the Jedi as long as they held passion for one another, and decided to part ways with them. Keldroma wanted to kill the Torrent Tech himself. The Jedi lovers had recently heard of another Sith war beast. However, it was not on Korriban. It was terrorizing the world of Kashyyyk. And with that, the three Jedi parted company and went on their separate missions. All of them, however, would end in catastrophe. Gon Han traveled to Kashyyyk, where the Wookiees told him of the terrible beast in the dark part of the forest that was eating their kind. 
the Jedi Suresh made his way down to the forest floor and lured the Tarentatech out of hiding. However, this challenge was more than he had bargained for, and his arrogance was his downfall. The Jedi could not handle the beast alone. His force-imbued blade would break inside of the creature's hide, and the Tarentatech would murder the young Jedi, devouring him whole. On Korriban, the two Jedi lovers felt the death of their comrade through the Force, and yet trudged on to face their challenge. But the dark side began to whisper in their ear. To corrupt them, Korriban began to speak. The Jedi Durin was unable to make a mental contact with the Tarentatech when they located it, attempting to confuse it, leaving the Jedi Shayla at a complete disadvantage when fighting the monster. The Jedi was skilled though, and held her own for a time. Eventually, Duran leapt into the battle to protect the Jedi, only to be instantly killed with a single slash of the Tarentatech's venomous claws. Wounded, however, the Tarentatech attempted to retreat, and in Durin's last moments, he received another vision of the Force. A vision of Revan wearing his cloak, while bringing down and killing Malak. But the Jedi, overcome with grief after losing her lover, Shayla gave into the dark side, as she vowed to murder the beast. Shayla no longer cared for the Jedi or the Sith, or even the light, or the dark, or even the great hunt. She wanted revenge. But as she stepped into the lair of the Tarentatech, the Solari crystal inside of her lightsaber began to turn against her, sensing that Shayla had betrayed the light. In the dying light of her dimming lightsaber, Shayla saw that behind the wounded Tarentatech was a much larger one, one of the biggest in recorded history emerging from the shadows. And here, the story of Shayla comes to an end. The three Jedi had all been right about one another. Their arrogance, their passion was their undoing. But the redeemed Revan would finish this mission, looking for star maps. Revan would find all of the skeletal remains of these Jedi on his adventure. Revan would even collect the cloak of Keldroma and would kill the Tarentatex on both Korriban and Kashyyyk. In a way, Revan was the fulfiller of the Great Hunt and would bring a conclusion to this chapter in Star Wars history, one of the darkest indeed. This is one of the eras of the Jedi history that is overshadowed and brushed over by many broader wars that the Jedi get into, but this is definitely one of those times that we believe is most dark in the lore. But what do you think, my friend? crashes in Star Wars happen all of the time. For one reason or another, it was actually quite common for a ship full of people to get stranded on a remote world and forced to survive by any means necessary. Traveling through space was treacherous and cruel, not to mention unpredictable. For most groups, this simply meant rationing out food, preparing for rescue, and attempting to repair your ship. For others, though, this was perhaps a death sentence. But then there was the third category, those who had no food, no hope, but refused to simply accept death. They would instead lose their minds and began some of the most depraved and sickening practices to ensure their own survival and that of their children. That is how the story of the children of Dagobah begins. So, steal yourself, acolytes, because today we will enter one of the most terrifying holocrons that we have. The story of the children of Dagobah begins in the year 40 BBY, when a ship carrying a Republic survey team crash landed on Dagobah. The swamp world was pretty deadly to anyone who wasn't a trained force sensitive. As we know, the planet was full of monsters, those that lurk in the muddy waters, creatures that howl in the night from the darkness of the wood, predatory insects, disease, and of course, a heavy presence of the dark side. It is an unfriendly world indeed, and the survey team would each die one by one from various causes after crash landing there, a few of them by the carnivorous plants, but most of them by fever. Originally, they had been an exploratory group for the beginnings of a new republic, the Mappers of Stars, but that was all so long ago now. The children of this survey team had developed an immunity to this fever though, and so managed to survive the plague that would take their parents. But things would soon take a worse turn. The adults had run out of food, and the people had no idea how to forage. Besides, it wasn't as though Dagobah was exactly rich in sustenance. Now starving and completely out of options, the jungle took their minds, and the adults began to feed their children with the flesh of their dead companions. Each time one of their number died of the illness or of starvation, the adults would simply cook them up and feed them to their children. 
very soon. They ran out of the dead, though, and the adults began to feed the children from their own flesh until they too died. The children began to view this as a normal process, and thus began a cannibalistic society in order to survive the harsh world. The oldest of them, a boy named Galt, had only been seven years old by the time that the last adult died. From that point forward, the children began to scour the jungle in search of any food. But of course, when one of them died, the feast would begin. They wouldn't be rediscovered actually until the year 1 ABY, when a group of smugglers landed on Dagobah in order to hide from the Empire. Among their group was an individual by the name of Plati Okife, the leader of the smugglers, her aide Truat, and most notably, two other kids by the name of Tash and Zack, as well as their uncle, Mammon Hul. They had been on the run from the Empire ever since they survived the destruction of Alderaan, and were attempting to uncover the secrets of the Lost Jedi. As present, they were being chased down by Boba Fett, as the Imperials had deemed them a threat as they were pursuing surviving Jedi. But that was when this group too got stuck in the mud. Upon seeing the children there though, the group was terrified. They could not tell whether they were human or not. They were now gaunt and skinny to the point of being skeletal. The children were missing many teeth with wiry hair and skin that seemed to stretch over their skulls. The group's leader pulled her blaster and shot one of the children, but Mam and Hul told her to hold her fire, as they were actually attempting to help them. Galt and the children of Dagobah took the group to their camp, which they called the Shelter. The children then offered whatever hospitality that they could muster, including a thin stew made of strips of meat. Unbeknownst to the group though, they were eating the body of Galt's companion, the very one that their leader had shot in the swamp just moments earlier. As the two kids and their uncle learned more about the children, it turned out that they were terrified of a tiny green creature that lived somewhere deep within the swamp. The group called it the Imp. Clearly, it seems that they have encountered the exiled Yoda at one point, and for some reason or another, became deathly afraid of him. For several days, the group had noticed nothing was wrong, as the smugglers were working on digging their ship out of the swamp, when one of them revealed that they were being hunted by the infamous bounty hunter Boba Fett, who had followed them to the world. The smugglers realized that there was no way to stop Boba, and so, they too decided to hunt him down. Because of this, the smugglers broke into smaller groups. But the children is not the only thing dangerous on Dagobah. In the swamp, they were attacked by what is known as knobby white spiders. These were giant, land speeder sized arachnid creatures native to Dagobah. In the fight, Truett received a head wound and had to be returned to the shelter by the children. Truett was left alone with the children there, while the other smugglers continued to hunt for Boba. When they returned though, they found the children had amputated his arm, claiming that it had been poisoned by the spiders and endangered the rest of his body. But it would be later when they would all learn the truth. Something terrible was in the stew, a ring that had belonged to their smuggler companion. But the children were not done. They also began to amputate his leg by the time that the rest of the group returned to the camp. It seems that in their desperation that they had gone from tasting the dead to eating a man alive piece by piece. When Zack attempted to reveal it to the others, the leader, Galt, captured him and locked him up in a cage alongside Boba. Boba, who had also gotten captured by the children of Dagobah at some point earlier miraculously, showing how the children had mastered the jungle. Zack and Boba managed to escape their cage though, and Zack led the children on a chase through the swamp one which ended up by the dark side cave near Yoda's home. Zack, of course, had no idea what the place was, but he did end up escaping and would trap several children in the cave. The cave then began to torture the group with visions of their past, showing them their parents who had nourished them with their own flesh. Gout and the rest of the children of Dagobah realized that what they had become was wrong and sick, as the dark side itself began to torment them with their atrocities the horror of what they had become. Displeased, Boba Fett still decided to take in one of the group named Zack for his large bounty, but the boy was later rescued by his sister in the smuggling team. The two kids and their uncle would later visit with Yoda, who revealed them to be Force-sensitive, and Yoda would actually give them wisdom before sending them on their way. The group, however, took a great amount of pity on the children who had been forced to live like this for so long, and as a result, he rounded them all up and took them with him on his ship. 
delivering the group to the Rebel Alliance. The smugglers entrusted the Rebels with the task of rehabilitating the children and introducing them back into galactic society. Eventually, the group would later go on to train at Luke Skywalker's Jedi Praxium for a few years, before going on to become anthropologists. Unfortunately though, we don't actually have a lot of information on what happened to the children of Dagobah, as they're really not heard of in the lore following this story. This version of the story is abridged from the 12th book of the Galaxy of Fear series, labeled The Hunger, as a side note and some smaller details about the story, specifically towards the end, may not be entirely accurate. This is because this story is actually extremely difficult to find. In the research for this video, we were unable to secure an actual copy of the book, since no PDF or complete synopsis exists anywhere online, and the book itself is very hard to come by. As such, we had to piece together the events of this story through several character bios and still manage to obtain what we believe is the entirety of the story, although some information is incomplete right now. There are some stories out there that are so deranged that even Star Wars wants to bury them. But the story goes to show us the effects that the dark side can have on the minds of the desperate, especially those who are not force sensitive. We have to remember that Dagobah is a place steeped with the dark side of the force. And this is an example of insanity and how it took the minds of even a group of young children. At they're the time of this, many things that a Jedi has to fear. When the Force is your ally, they are the champions of light, wielding their power in the name of justice. But in the times when they are afraid, truly afraid, their power leaves them, and they are just as vulnerable as any other person would be. At all times, they must ensure that they remain courageous and turn away from fear. But there are things that even Jedi Masters are afraid of. Imagine, if you will, a being like Darth Nihilus, a monster of pure instinct that hunted individual Jedi for sport, a being which literally preyed on the living force and treated Jedi like lambs to the slaughter. Well, we believe that there could be something potentially worse than Darth Nihilus. There was a creature called the Nameless, which is a bit of a misnomer, especially considering the fact that it went by many names, including the Shri Karai, literally translating to the Eaters of the Force. Well, my friends, welcome back to the archives, and in today's video holocron, we will open up the dark mirrors of the galaxy and explore the terror of the Nameless, the monster under the bed of the Jedi Order. Now, let us begin. The Nameless hails from the planet known simply as X, located in deep wild space. The first appearance of the Nameless was during the time of the High Republic era, as they hatched from beautiful jewel-like eggs, traded around as precious trinkets. But of course, no one suspects the truth of what lay inside these mysterious eggs. Upon hatching, the Shri Karai are sludged like larvae that must feed immediately in order to grow and take form but as they become more of their true selves, the Nameless will gain its distinguishing features. They were very large humanoids, possessing four legs tipped with three long claws, claws which twitched uncontrollably as they moved. They had a long, stringy tail and a broad head that features tentacles on the back dangling around their mouth. Their skin was often deathly pale, and they possess glowing blue or red eyes. However, very few Force sensitives actually saw the Nameless in its true form. The Nameless had powers in the Force that it used to terrorize the Jedi, to seize their prey. Trying to sense the Nameless through the Force was extremely difficult. Someone could be lost to madness or see hallucinations, leaving them unable to truly see what the creature was. The hallucinations were different for every Jedi, resulting in perceptions of the creature varying from a towering monstrous being or simply a darkness with hundreds of teeth and eyes. The terror would overwhelm the senses of the Jedi, cutting them off from the Force, making them powerless to fight against their predator. When the Nameless would catch their prey, it would use its tentacles to drain the living Force from their bodies, leaving them as nothing but a gray, calcified husk, frozen in an eternal final scream. But what makes this creature so deadly is that it doesn't even have to personally encounter its victim in order to drain them. If the victim is within a certain distance of the Nameless and it knows them, it can begin to slowly drain them of the Force. This rapidly ages the victim and causes their vitals to gradually weaken, eventually shutting down until they become nothing but a husk. Even at a greater distance, the creatures obscure the Force from their victims, inducing a sense of dread and on the edge of one's consciousness, a magnifying existence of panic and exhaustion. The Nameless would feed off of the madness that they created within a Jedi's mind, 
it made them delicious. The worst part is that the process was slow. Some Jedi are thrown into an uncontrollable seizure every now and then, with the fear and confusion of the presence of the Nameless putting the Force user into a state of terror, in which they will feel cut off from the Force and reality. And the worst part is, the effects last for a long time. These creatures, just like Darth Nihilus, were driven by a desperate desire to feed a hunger, one that they could not satiate. Imagine, if you will, a species created by the dark side of the Force, the galaxy itself, to be an army of rabid Nihiluses. Unlike the Sith Lord of Legend, however, they understood absolutely nothing beyond this hunger, and were incapable of comprehending certain dangers of their well-being. The Nameless have been known to push through fatal wounds and hunt despite radiation poisoning. They could not be stopped until they were killed in totality, as they could not be controlled except through a few artifacts. The Jedi would soon discover this, combining the artifacts known as the Rod of Seasons with the Rod of Daybreak in order to form what they called the Rod of Power. It only took a single one of the Shri Karai, known as the Leveler, to scare the entirety of the Jedi Order of the High Republic though, despite this new weapon. The Leveler was let loose on Starlight Beacon, which was a space station isolated in the middle of space, and many powerful Jedi Masters were trapped inside there. One legendary Jedi of this era, by the name of Loden Greatstorm, would fall prey to the Leveler. The history of the Shri Karai and the Leveler itself is pretty intricate, so we'll offer a quick summary of their origins. Long ago, a family known as the Rose, deep in wild space, had a history of conflict with the Jedi causing them to unleash the species, the Shri Karai. It was theorized, but never confirmed by the Jedi that the creatures were made using the dark side, and that they originated from the artifacts and the rods that we mentioned just briefly earlier. However, the fate of the family was sealed during this conflict, and all of them were nearly wiped out. Many of the rods were lost to history, as it was believed that the Nameless ran rampant. What was later thought to be a final egg of the Shri Karai made it into the hands of a cult by the name of the Path of the Open Hand. This cult believed that when anyone who could actually use the Force, including the Jedi, this made them innately extremely dangerous. So they began revering the beasts and worshipping them as the great equalizer of the galaxy, calling them the Great Levelers, believing that the creatures would make the galaxy an equal place for all through their mass mutilation of Force sensitives. They believed the Nameless to be an agent of balance, and the one who held the rod would control them as the champion of balance. The path of the open hand planned to obtain the Rods of Power in order to control the beasts and unleash them once again on the Jedi. While the cult was looking for the Rods, however, the egg would hatch prematurely when one of the cultists unleashed it to attack a group of Jedi. During the rampage in the Holy City of Jedi, this beast would kill one Jedi after another, hunting them insatiably. During the event, the cult, the Open Hand, managed to collect both the Rod of the Seasons and the Rod of Daybreak. They then formed them together to create the Rod of Power, which unilaterally controlled all of the Nameless under their will. However, not the Alpha, the Leveler. The path then went on and would find Planet X, which was ripe with dozens of nameless eggs. The Jedi chased the path to this base and fought them in a final climactic battle, one which became known as the Night of Sorrow due to the sheer number of Jedi that would die by the dozens to the nameless. Eventually though, the nameless began to turn on the cultists that they served, since many of them were also force sensitives. The current controller of the Rod of Power, someone by the name of Marda, decided to set off an explosion at the end of the battle, one which killed a bulk of the Shri Karai, all except for the Leveler, leaving the Alpha as the last of its kind. In that explosion though, the Rod of Power also broke into two pieces, back into the Rods of Daybreak and the Rod of Seasons. Marda maintained control of the Rod of Seasons and kept the Leveler as her own, escaping deep within the night as the Path of the Open Hand disintegrated. Marda promised though, as the last remaining member of the cult, along with the Leveler, that the Jedi would pay even if it meant her descendants would need to enact it. Meanwhile, Grandmaster Yoda wiped out all of the Nameless from all sources in the galaxy that he could find, including from the Jedi Archives, not wanting them to ever be used against the Jedi Order as well, even if it meant that another Jedi would learn about them first. This is how dangerous Yoda deemed them, but many believe that Yoda made a mistake here, in doing so, this left the Jedi Order completely unaware of this threat's existence and a possible return, and eventually, the Nameless did return. 
In Yoda's lifetime, in fact, the leveler came to be frozen in ice in the shrine underneath the surface of the planet of Rystan, guarded by a droid attendant and visited by further generation of the Mardas family, the last members of the cult. They also split the Rod of Seasons in two and hid it in separate locations so that no one could ever find it. And so, the monster would remain there for 150 years, until something strange started to happen. Jedi were beginning to have terrifying visions and nightmares of the creature's return, a vision of pure chaos and calamity. Finally, a member of the Roe family who had controlled the Leveler long ago manipulated the terrorists known as the Nile to orchestrate a conflict in order to distract the Jedi. The Roe then took the frozen Leveler and set it to defrost, unleashing it yet again the creature's first victim, and the proof of its return was the legendary Jedi Master, Loden Greatstorm. Seeing his calcified husk of a body left the Jedi Order perplexed, and several friends of the Jedi, including his Padawan, was in a state of intense grief. Soon, Ro and the Nile ended up obtaining more eggs of the Nameless, seven eggs in total. Planning a strike against the Republic and the Jedi, the group went about executing a complex plan to set loose the Nameless on Starlight Beacon. The Nile also sabotaged the Beacon systems, cutting off security measures and shutting down most of its power, leaving all on board in complete darkness. Now this would be a great Star Wars horror film. The creatures rampaged across the space station, with the trapped Jedi being picked off one by one. Roe and the Nile succeeded in taking down Starlight Beacon, and all of the Jedi in the galaxy were recalled to the temple on Coruscant in great fear. There, Yoda was forced to face the consequences of his past actions and decision to delete them from the archives. It became clear to the Nile that they were using a power that they did not understand, and Roe had become drunk with using the Nameless, gone insane by the generations past. Finally though, the terrorist group were outmaneuvered and defeated by the Jedi Order. Roe himself would vanish deep into the galaxy yet again, keeping the rest of the Nameless caged away and hungry waiting to be released. From that day forward, Yoda's consequences would continue. The Nameless became legend. They were the subject of nursery rhymes, expressions, and old ghost stories. For generations, Jedi younglings traded fantastical stories about the creature, even up until the time that Dooku was a Padawan. Dooku even mentions once to Ventress how he thought himself above the rumored stories that his peers would share about these old monsters. It had become a haunt to the Jedi Order, the one thing that could spook them when nothing else ever would. Their own monster under the bed. But the worst part about these prophecies within the holocrons, including the holocron containing the prophecy of the Chosen One, mentions the return of the Nameless at some point in the future. This is one of the few enemies that the Jedi were unable to defeat the only thing that really scares them to their core, order-wide. There aren't many things the Jedi fear. With the Force as their ally, they are champions of the light, the wielders of justice. But when it comes to the Nameless, out there in the stars waiting, hungry, the Jedi will never forget them. And now, neither will you. As always, my friends, may the Force be with you, and have a phenomenal day.